Good evening to all. I'm going to get started with our script as people come in. It is March 25th, 2021. Uh, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with deliberation of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure participation, public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note the meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating via video conference. Please be aware that others may be able to see you. Take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available in the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted in Novus, unless I note. Otherwise, I will introduce each speaker for any response. Uh, please wait until the floor is yielded to you. Uh, every vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Um, I think that we have a lot of, um, got a lot of people here with us already, which is great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and check the people who I know are always here, and then we'll go from there. So Ms. Exton? Here. Mr. Cardin? Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, Dr. Allison Ampey is not going to be here this evening. Um, Mr. Thielman? Waiting for him, Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Hayner. Here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bodie. I'm here. Dr. McNeil. Here. Dr. Mason. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Ms. Keys. Hello. Um, I see Mr. Thielman. Um, okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. As always, our agendas are, are long and we have lots of things to do. So um, the first item on the agenda is public comment this evening, but nobody signed up in advance for public comment. So we will go ahead and move to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, the Safe Routes to School report. This is um, something that was brought to us by Mr. Schlickman um, after attending a transportation advisory committee meeting. Um, and so we are uh, excited to welcome Ms. Uh, Ms. Crocker here this evening to talk to us about uh, safe routes to school. So Ms. Crocker, can you hear me okay? Oh, perfectly. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. So um, you can go ahead and um, you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm just going to share my screen. So please bear with me. Share. All right. Can everyone see my screen? It looks great. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. All right. We're in business. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Judy Crocker. I am the Massachusetts um, Department of Transportation Safe Routes to School Outreach Coordinator that serves Arlington. So tonight we're just going to give an overview of the, pro of the program and um, maybe some next steps about what we'd like to see the program do in Arlington. So MassDOT Safe Routes to School program is a free federally funded public K-8 program and we work to increase safety for walking and biking by using a collaborative community-centered approach that bridges the gap between health and, and transportation. Um, the program originated, originated excuse me, in Denmark. It's in about 35, uh, 45 countries. It's in all 50 states. The parent company or organization, I should say, is the Department of Transportation. Thus, we are MassDOT here in Massachusetts. Um, MassDOT participates in about 65% of Massachusetts communities. At the end of the day, it's all about safety, 
everyone here, we just want the kiddos to be safe. So no matter what transportation mode the students use, we just want safety is the bottom line. So Safe Roots is not a one size fits all program. Every school has its own challenges and successes. And we have a very large toolbox. And what we try to do is customize what your needs are and how we can best benefit your students based on our programming. And these are some of the ways that people use our program. So Safe Roots has a public health foundation based on what is commonly known as the six E's, which are listed here. I'm gonna review these very briefly tonight. Um, oftentimes though, it is kind of the chicken and the egg. Um, I think so many, so many times all of us have heard parents say, you know, I don't want my child walking to school because there's too much traffic and the car goes fast and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what do they do? They get in the car and they're part of the traffic. So, um, you know, we, we try to break those cycles of behavior. We are also not a stay in your lane program. So as much as we work with schools, we equally work with municipalities and the community at large. So let's dig right in. So when we talk about evaluation, we have various um, ways of making um, different walk shed and bike shed maps here in the office. Um, and we use those maps to actually develop what we call a route map. Um, the safest, what we think of between where the students live and how to get to school, uh, we actually make out routes. Uh, we use those route maps for a couple of different purposes. One of them is called park and walk locations. Um, we are trying to lessen parent traffic in and around a school campus. So we suggest different satellite areas around the community, the neighborhoods around that school. Um, and we're all counting our steps these days. So it's just one way of parents to park, maybe collectively, and then walk the kiddos to school. The other way we use these route maps is we create what we call walking school buses or bike trains. So many of us, um, growing up, we walked to school, picked up a friend, went to another house, picked up another friend. Today, they give everything a name. It's called a walking school bus. The same for bikes would be a bike train. So what we can do on these route maps is that we can actually identify different meeting spots with approximate times. We actually have a stencil kit that, that's available. Uh, you can mark it on the sidewalk or um, side of the road. Um, and that just helps um, you know, kind of the, uh, the group mentality. It's always more fun with a friend. And then particularly this year with the given current events, we have many different ways to celebrate how the students are getting to school, uh, whether they are at home or they are, um, you know, in person learning this year. Um, basically there's so much screen time, we're trying to get everyone to move. So we do applaud um, Arlington on your um, school website. You do have your uh, maps of each of the individual schools. They usually list um, major uh, intersections, the sidewalks, um, crosswalks, that type of thing. So they're not so much route maps, it's just neighborhood maps. Engineering. So we do some engineering in, um, in the office and you know, um, full disclosure, you know, principals um, didn't go to school and get all their degrees to be a traffic engineer. And quite honestly, we do what we call soft engineering in our office, which is working on best practices. And what we typically do, um, two different avenues, we do arrival dismissal observation. So that would be, for example, in the upper left corner, we're looking at the school property itself and how it's managed. Um, how do you use your front door? Do you separate modes of traffic? What type of sign do you use? Things like that. Um, then from there, we can, um, you know, school day is really home to school. So you have to walk through the neighborhood and that's the lower left picture. So if the red circle is where the school is, you have to transverse the neighborhood in order to get there. That's what we call a walk audit. So we're looking at the infrastructure, you know, are the sideways, uh, sidewalks um, covered with vegetation? What do the crosswalks look like? Um, conditions in general. Um, and this is, you know, so we deal, with the, we deal with the school property as much as municipal property. Another avenue that we've done, and this is something that we've been doing this year at the Dalen and the Thompson schools, is that we can actually do some arrival dismissal planning or circulation planning. Um, 
you know, if you speak to principals, so many people say that, um, you know, I wish people would just follow the rules. So sometimes when you ask, so what are your rules? Um, they tend to be car centric. Um, that's why uh, we tried to call this arrival dismissal and not drop off and pick up. Um, and also, where do you find it? Are they on your website? Um, are they in your handbook? Are they just in principal newsletters, et cetera? So that's uh, usually we do the, for planning a two page document and that's in the lower right for an example. We tried to include a map on one side which just separates the modes of transportation and tells people where they should go. And this is an example of the text, which would be the reverse side. So this is translatable. Um, again, we tried to include all forms of transportation. Um, some folks like to put their bell schedule on there just to really you know, um, drive that home for the parents. Next, we have education. Uh, we focus on pedestrian and bicycle safety. Uh, for pedestrian safety, it is skills-based, so it is DESE approved. We focus on grades two, three. However, we can elevate the program to grades K through eight. For example, with the Merrimack gas explosions, we were doing everybody. Um, so we also offer uh, professional development uh, for, for both of these um, curriculums. And um, particularly for the bike safety, um, we often will ask parents to help us. So we have each have a smaller group. Um, we can do peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, for example, in neighboring Winchester, um, the, the middle school student council helps out with the neighboring elementary school, um, et cetera. So this is a 30 minute outdoor lesson on school property. Then we have bike safety. So bike safety, we do not have a bike for every child. So it is not skills-based. So Desi does call this enrichment. Um, this is usually assembly style. It's 30 to 45 minutes. We deal with personal safety, bike safety, and rules of the road. Um, it tends to be two for the older grades, usually grades four, five, and then middle school. And again, depending on the age, is depending exactly what we might have included. Um, we for this, we do have um, videos online. We have written curriculum materials, um, as we do with pedestrian safety, and we also have virtual uh, learning options. Um, uh, I have one colleague, she's done many times, it looks like a Brady Bunch of everyone trying on the helmet and we do helmet fits online. So um, again, just trying to um, get everyone moving and be flexible in our programming. Another big aspect of our education is for the parents. Uh, we do try to educate parents. They are not in traffic, they are the traffic. So in many neighborhoods, we see the, you know, the green men or signage, you know, Please slow down, you know, my child lives here. Um, and how often do we have uh, students that are getting off in the roadways? We have parents parking on both sides of the road in both directions, using the middle of the road to load and unload, um, parking in fire lanes. Um, so these are all pictures actually that I took doing my observations at the Dalen and Thompson schools this year. So for the parents, we have two different flyers. One. Uh, discusses uh, school zone driving, and the other is arrival and dismissal. These are both available in 10 languages. So we come to encouragement. Encouragement is the fun part. That's where we celebrate how we get to school. Um, most Arlington schools do participate in two out of our three flagship events. We have one in October for International Walk Day. Um, upcoming in May is Massachusetts Walk to School Day, and in February we have a winter walk. We have a whole library of no cost, low cost themes to try to make this even more fun. Uh, pictured here is Crazy Sock Day. Doesn't get more basic than that. Um, and we do have a lot of forms of co uh, communication to try to encourage, you know, behavior change does take baby steps to get there. So um, if principals need help with language, we can help with that for newsletters and such. Um, and we do recommend forming some type of task force just so Safe Roots has some place to live. It could be a PTO subcommittee, it could be townwide, school-wide. Um, you know, in some communities it's the Y, some communities it's the police station, et cetera. Um, in March, we actually have a lot going on for the public and um, we just closed our crossing guard appreciation nominations, but we have extended our lawn sign contest. Um, I think a lot of people have things going on with the new DESE directive. So um, we pushed this up to um, just before April vacation. 
and the theme this year is be seen. Um, and engagement. Engagement formally known as enforcement. Um, again, we have a lot of training for crossing guards. Um, uh, Officer Ratu is um, on this. He, he's uh, very well versed on this material. Uh, we do a lot of communication. Um, pictured here is actually a bike assembly. It's from a neighboring community where um, the police and the school nurse called me in. They were having issues and a couple intersections with the kiddos. And so I invited the police to come in and speak for a few minutes. I mean, it's their backyard type thing. So more the merrier. So equity is the last E. And in um, most uh, culture, this is our overarching umbrella. Um, that transverses all our ease. Um, we have actually been fortunate enough to partner with the MASC and we've created wellness policies, uh, wellness amendments, I should say, for that policy. Um, every school has a wellness, a wellness policy. So we, um, on our website, we have some um, examples um, to use to um, add active transportation to your policies. Um, we offer things in multiple languages and we do include students of all abilities. Um, but the, um, the icons that I have here, the diagram is actually, um, you know, any, most communities have multiple elementary schools and then um, to middle to high school. So it's nice if you have uniform communication and expectations across the way, whether it be for circulation plans um, or even say for pedestrian, um, safety instruction. Um, it's, it, it's one thing if one or two schools volunteer and they raise their hands to do it, but it's just nicer to have it, the curriculum embedded so that it's offered for every student. We do have a COVID uh, document uh, that we came out with last summer, and this has been extremely popular. Um, again, trying to, um, you know, there's so much going on. We fully understand we're one more thing, but the kiddos still have to get to school. So, um, trying just to streamline the process a little bit for many communities. So here we are with Arlington. Um, so Arlington was one of the top, the first three pilot programs um, for uh, Safe Routes to School program in the US um, through the federal um, DOT program. Um, again, most schools participate in um, our fall and spring uh, walk to school event. Um, you guys have great use of your crossing guards and uh, really good infrastructure, your complete streets policy. Um, in the lower right picture, that is um, from the ribbon cutting from the, um, the Dalen um, infrastructure grant that was received. And um, I think that's even Jay Kaufman in the picture on the left. Um, and I think they've already started on the, um, the grant that you guys received for the Stratton School in 2019. So. Um, these are um, almost under 2 million, but you know, considerable grants collectively. Um, and again, we've done um, arrival dismissal reports and a circulation planning for the Dalen and the Thompson School this calendar year, or the school year. So um, my appreciation to Dr. Brody, um, who has helped me work with um, uh, the planning department. Um, I've worked with Daniel Amstutz, um, and he has, he reached out to Safe Roots because they were trying to, for a sustainability program, um, trying to um, work on a, um, um, like a ped bike master plan. They were interested in how many students actually walked and biked to school. So uh, with Dr. Brody's permission, we did our parent travel survey for all schools. And this is what you have listed here. Um, unfortunately, we started this, um, the second week of March a year ago. <laughs> and so we did extend the uh, survey period um, into April, but I think overall we had less participation than we would have from, uh, from Arlington um, on a regular day. Um, so I do wanna give a shout out to the Hardy School because they still pulled off you know, more than 25%. Um, so as you can see from this, an average was about 52% of um, Arlington students do walk and bike to school. Um, but we still, and more students tend to walk in the morning and more people tend to use the cars in the, uh, for afternoon pickup, probably all those after school activities. So looking at the arrival dismissal reports that I just did, um, 
the Dalen I did in, I want to say November, October, November. So it was really nice weather. And the Thompson was um, December, January. So let's just say it was chilly and then snowy. Um, we had an uh, average every day AM and PM of 600 to 131 cars. So it's still disconcerting because you have one third of your school population in school approximately, and you still have that many cars. So a lot going on. So what we suggest for next steps. So we would love to work with Arlington to make your program more sustainable. We actually have a sustainability document, which I can forward to you after this meeting. Um, and on this, we like to focus on the schools itself, break it out to the district, break it out to the municipality, and then um, any statewide um, help with, that we can get. The first one we'd like to do is form a Safe Routes Task Force. Again, um, a year ago, January, um, I tried this. And we had a few people from the municipal side, a few people from some schools, but it wasn't the robust Arlington drive that I was really hoping for. Um, and then current events. So um, hoping to jumpstart this again, um, trying to um, did not put my foot on the gas on this one this year, given everything else going on. Um, but for example, because I've been working at the Day and Linda Thompson, both of the principals are, are very excited to get this going. Um, we do recommend professional development for our pedestrian and bike curriculum. It is being performed at some schools and then even speaking to some principals, you know, oh, I think we used to do that type of thing. So just to make this um, a regular event, um, it's almost like civics. It's bringing back that um, everyday, um, education. Um, we also looking to the school committee uh, suggests that you adopt the wellness policy um, amendments. Um, again, just to put active transportation into your um, um, what you do. And, um, and even, you know, and then looking forward, I think we all want to give a jump start to uh, what next fall is going to look like. And um, we have time working with the principals and the PTOs. Um, to really try to get people, I think everyone's coming at the fall with eyes wide open. So it's a great opportunity to really start a back to school uh, campaign of uh, walking and biking. So in closing, I always like to bring it back to the kiddos. Um, we just try to, again, want everyone to be safe, want everyone to be happy, but we'd love to get everyone out walking and biking. Any questions? I, I spoke fast because I was told I only had 15 minutes. <laughs> you did very well. Thank you so much. Um, so questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Schickman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I want to point out that Dallin was one of the very, very first Safe routes to school uh, projects that the state did. We we piloted this thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's what uh, it's got to be like fifteen years later. We're coming back mm -hmm. to the same place, and and the reason why I, I was interested in bringing some discussion of this back is that uh, Ms. Crocker was appearing before the uh, for, before the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee talking about traffic pattern and routing. And I thought it was important that uh, that we know what is happening out there as well and that we can support uh, safe travel to school um, through, through this program. So thank you for coming by and uh, please keep us in touch as uh, suggestions are put on the table for changing traffic patterns around our schools because I know that if that happens, parents are gonna be talking to us about it. Thanks. Thank you for attending so that I can attend this, so. Anybody else? Mr. Hainer? I just wanna say that I think educating children in the safety of uh, transportation will increase their awareness. So as they become adults, it'll become a lot easier to make sure cars are appropriately uh, coming to school and not stopping in the middle and causing potential hazards. 
So thank you again for all the work you've done and hopefully we'll be able to continue it here in town. Thank you. Great, anybody else? Uh, Dr. Bodhi. There, thank you, Mr. Quacker. Um, uh, you had some great suggestions here, we'll follow up. And I know that this is one of the things that is very attractive for Arlington as a community, that it is a, is a district where uh, students pretty much walk to school. And, um, and I can tell you then the new school, the new high school, we're actually putting in more bike racks to encourage that. I will add to that comment though, that I, I, I hope that drivers in Arlington are careful. I just was driving today and I, I saw something that was, you know, not safe if, if a child had been on a bike. So I think that's something that we all need to be conscious of that as we encourage more biking, that puts more responsibility on the adults. Um, we did have a uh, safe bike curriculum. And let me look into that. I think that um, certainly what happened last March and this year has has sort of put that uh, to the side, but I think that's something we need to bring back next year. So thank you very much. And thank you for your partnership with us. Thank you. And if I could be so bold, um, congratulations on your new chapters ahead of you. I understand, so. Thank you. Great, so if you could um, send us the materials yes. that you talked about, especially any language around the um, wellness policy amendments and mm -hmm. we can get that to the right place, that would be great. So thank I you shall. so much. Thank you and all, thank you so much for the opportunity and happy spring. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda uh, is listed as um, an update from the AEA and I think I will leave it at that as I turn it over to um, Ms. Keys. Thank you. Uh, this is a super happy update. So I'm really happy to share this with all of you. Uh, many of you know Susan Suarez. She has been a paraprofessional teaching assistant at the Stratton School for over a decade now. And she was one of the leaders in forming the paraprofessionals union here in Arlington a few years ago when Jason Levy was the AEA president. And in recognition for the work that she has done at the school and in organizing and elevating the role of our paraprofessionals here in town, she has been recognized as MTA's Education Support Professional of the Year. Um, she's the one in the state and who's getting this honor. So we are so proud of Susan. We are all better for the work that she did here. Um, our paraprofessionals are pulled from their roles much less often to be covering. So they're able to serve students in the roles that they've been hired to do. She has worked to get, we have consistent job descriptions. We got a pay raise for our paras. So we're able to attract more people and keep more people. It's still not where we all want it to be, but we're gonna keep working on that as time goes on. And really like, this year we've seen how important these paraprofessionals are to our schools and to keeping them going. And we have some great talent here because of Susan's work. So I just wanted to make sure the whole community knows that Susan has been honored by the MTA and given this award. Um, we went to Stratton School and took some pictures this morning. So the news story is going out there. Uh, she's gonna be working with other communities around the state to help them elevate the role of their paras just like we've done here in Arlington. And I just wanted you to introduce you all to her and let you let her say hello. She says she's much more comfortable working behind the scenes. So I'm not gonna call on her to like make a speech, but I wanted to make sure that the school committee and our administration and everybody got to recognize Susan for her great achievement. Thank you so much, Thank Ms. You. Keys. Thank you. Congratulations to Ms. Thank Sores. Um, Dr. Bodhi, did you wanna add anything? I, I would. Um, I thank you for that introduction. And I want to, my heartfelt congratulations. I cannot think of a somebody who supports education who deserves this honor more. So um, Susan, thank you so much. And, and all of the students who have benefited from your, your support, I know were, if they were here tonight, they would be also cheering you on. 
Um, you certainly have given so much to Arlington and truly without your leadership, um, we would not be where we are today uh, with our um, a, a, a contract for our paraprofessionals, which they have so richly deserved um, over the years. So thank you so much. And um, I hope there's another decade <laughs> that you'll be with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Great, thank you, Dr. Bodie. Um, anybody else on this one? I can certainly speak on behalf of the school committee that we are so honored to have you here with us this evening um, to share um, in a small part of this award with you. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that you're being so richly celebrated across all areas of your professional life. I'm sure that your family must be so, so proud of you. And I know that your, your Stratton family and your Arlington family are as well. So on behalf of the school committee, we um, are so glad that you came tonight. We're grateful that Ms. Keys um, brought this here to us and uh, we wish you many, many congratulations uh, and, and look forward to, to what's to come for you. So congratulations, thank you so much. All right, um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, an update on the travel policy and uh, quarantine protocols from Dr. Bodie. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, well, the, the, the uh, travel protocols have been disseminated to everyone. So uh, I don't know if you really want me to go through each part of, uh, of that, but I will tell uh, everyone that what motivated this change was multi-prong. One, we are certainly, as you know, we're gonna talk more about this this evening. Um, our students are coming back Full time in person, and you know when we look at our uh, what had been our, our policy prior to this, uh, that one of the uh, outcomes when students were uh, came back from travel and they had to remain at home for the, the ten days, uh, and later it was uh, five days test and be back on day eight. But even with that the number of days that you'd be out of school were considerably less than they would be when we return full-time. That's one, one of the issues. Um, but also other issues is that the governor changed the regulations on travel. Um, it, it changed from um, a order to a um, advisory. But even before that happened, which was a surprise to us uh, on Friday, we had already begun uh, looking at the policy, uh, primarily for the reason that I just gave, is that what the, uh, what the impact would be. And we also known from our, our surveillance pull testing program that the, the incidence of positive cases in our, our schools was very low. Um, so that contributed also um, to a change in the policy. And in general, our, our number of cases, whether um, identified from an outside testing uh, company, uh, was also very low. So the conditions in which we could um, uh, re relax some of these restrictions uh, just made sense. And I will, I will give a lot of credit to our nurses who were certainly unanimously behind having some kind of less restrictive policy. Now, one of the things actually we talked about yesterday in the policy subcommittee meeting was whether uh, pool testing would be something that we, we would really strongly encourage um, our our families that travel out of Massachusetts to consent to be part of. And I think that that is something that uh, we certainly can add to this, uh, this uh, protocol that we have. And it certainly is something that we encourage our families. I, I know our principals are encouraging families to participate. And this is something that we 
uh, will have been doing as a district as well. Right now, our participation rate is 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 87 percent on average from K to um, the eighth grade. Our high school uh, right now is in the process of developing a protocol, and as you as you are aware, our athletes have a mandatory um, testing requirement, which is something that we can put in place uh, for our students. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about this. I know another part of this agenda item is talking about quarantine protocols, but maybe before we get into that part of this um, agenda topic, we can talk a little bit more, um, see if there's any questions or concerns uh, about the travel protocol. Great, that sounds good. This I put this on the agenda, lots can change in two weeks. <laughs> so when we were here two weeks ago, uh, we were in a different place and there were some questions and, and you know, uh, from, the, from the committee about where we were at at that point. And then policy met on Monday and the governor changed his mind the Friday before. And so anyway, here we are. Uh, and it's just different than it was two weeks ago. So, um, but I don't like, uh, don't like pulling things off the agenda that I say that we're going to talk about. So here we are. Um, mm -hmm. So questions from the committee around. Um, so Dr. Bodie, and also just to specify, you sort of got into the the pooled testing piece here. So um, I know that that's something that I have a couple of questions about. So I think let's talk about travel and then let's talk about pooled like student pool testing and then quarantine policy protocols, if that's all right with you. So questions from the committee about the travel policy as it is now. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank the superintendent for bringing up the pool testing with regard to the travel, because if we are going to be successfully opening our schools and keeping everybody safe, uh, the pool testing program is an essential part of it. So I asked that it be included in the travel documents. And I once again reiterate that uh, people who are traveling out of state uh, should be also be participating in the pool testing program and that we should have that in bold letters on this document and basically anything else we're sending out to people with regards to uh, having students attending school uh, once we go to a full reopening. All right, anybody else? Um, so I did when, so talking about pool testing because it came up here, I did put in the, um, in Novus, a couple of policies, one from Watertown and one for Somerville, um, not necessarily advocating that this is the way to go from in Arlington, but I thought it was important for the committee to see that there are, we do have some neighboring districts who are moving towards a mandatory pool testing program for students. Um, I think you know there. We currently are in an opt-in situation. There could also be an opt-out situation. Um, but I would, you know, at some point, not necessarily tonight because we're not prepared for it. But would like to have a conversation about what that what student testing looks like in Arlington moving forward. There's um, no reason to believe that we're going to see a vaccine for kids 11 and under uh, this calendar year. Um, so this is not just a this school year thing. This is going to be a next school year thing as well, um, especially and particularly in our elementary schools. So um, I think a lot of what we do now will be how we carry on. Um, and I am, I, you know, I like 87%. I think that that's really good. I like 95% or 98% participation better. <laughs> and I also recognize that the 87% is not consistent across all schools, right? So if we average 87, there are some that are, are you know, quite a, not quite a bit, but lower than that. And then there are some that are higher than that, right? That's how averages work. So um, I want to make sure that as we move towards April 5th, for our elementary schools and then after April vacation for our um, sixth through eighth graders that we're really thinking about what, um, how we want to talk about pool testing, how we wanna prioritize it in communication from principals and how we can drive that participation rate up because it just seems to me to be such a critical piece of how we keep this as safe as possible. Um, 
you know, as we finish out this school year and as we think about next year. So um, I, I wanted to bring that up. I'm not sure if it's something that we, the committee wants to have a conversation about here in two weeks time, if we wanna talk about it in a subcommittee. Um, so I did wanna bring it up and see what people had to say about that this evening. Mr. Hainer and then Ms. Exton. Uh, I think it's important for this conversation begin uh, to happen, but I also think there's a lot of information that uh, we don't have at this point with regard to mandatory testing of uh, students and potentially staff and things of that nature. So in the interim, I think uh, we need to find this information out. I'm talking about the idea of mandating testing. And then the question comes up, if a child uh, shows positive, the responsibility of the school as far as providing education while the child is quarantined or being dealt with with regard to that. These are questions that need answering. Um, Ms. Exton and then Mr. Schlickman. I would just um, echo Ms. Morgan's comments uh, about around looking into it further. Um, I've also, I'm not seeing it here in Novus tonight, but I've seen the Somerville um, and the Watertown policies. I would add Martha's Vineyard also has a mandatory testing policy. Um, and, and I think as we're bringing more and more students back, we, we need to continue to have that conversation to make sure that we're keeping all of our students safe and our teachers. Not every single teacher can be vaccinated. And so we need to be, continue to be vigilant um, for the adults in the building as well. Thanks. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we talked about whether this should be an advisory or mandated. The question is, do we have the authority to mandate participation in the pool testing program? And if we are, I would strongly support making it a mandate. So I think that uh, if the chair who has the access to our uh, attorney can inquire as to whether that's permissible to mandate pool, uh, participation in pool testing, I think that would uh, make a, make our decision a lot easier going forward. Uh, Dr. Bodie and then Mr. Thielman. Oh, I defer to Mr. Thielman if you'd like to speak first. Okay, uh, so, you know, my, my question is, I thought we've been getting reports that participation in pool testing has been pretty good. I mean, are we concerned that we're not gonna have people participate in pool testing and that's why we have to go to something that's mandatory? Uh, I, I, I'm I not concerned about it. I think mm -hmm. that if, if I could, um, I, I would say our participation increases all the time. Yeah. So I think that's very good. Um, th there, are two, there are two parts of this question, whether you can legally mandate pool testing. There is the mandating the pool testing itself, which that is, um, is an issue in which I actually plan to talk to town council about. But the second part is this. When we have a positive vial, our next step in our protocol is that we have um, students and staff, anybody that was represented in that positive vial um, have a by next now test, which is a diagnostic test. And if in the case, which has only happened really twice, um, where the by next now was not diagnostic, then we've gone to a PCR, which is definitely another diagnostic test. And we have been able to determine the positivity. I'm not sure but this is something we can look into, whether the diagnostic test is something that um, a school committee can mandate. So, I mean, these are, these are questions that I'm, I, I'm happy to research and will, but if we can't follow through on our protocol, um, then it's going to be difficult to actually identify when we potentially would have a positive case. So right now, um, Fortunately, our incidence is very low, and I echo what Ms. Exton said. I, we want to make sure that we have the safest 
working and learning environment that we possibly can. And while many, many of our teachers will be vaccinated by the time we, we, um, we open full time on um, April 5th, not everyone will be. So we, we're certainly going to maintain all of the safety protocols we currently have in place. But I do think there's some legal questions around this that need to be explored a little bit more before we can uh, talk about um, this further about mandating. Right. Um, just in, uh, so one thing in the interim, Dr. Bodhi, if I think it would go a long way if you could really work with your your principal teams. I know that the signups and the this has mm -hmm. been largely delegated to the principals, as is appropriate at each school. But um, you know, really work with them over the next week or so to really let's really push this. Let's you know get it out. Even you know let's really over communicate about this really big press to do this um, and see because you know I I um, you know having having looked at the participation you know and to answer Mr. Thielman's question a little bit you know it it it, it varies by school a little bit right so I mean if if there's you know where we see very very high participation 98 percent right it's like no there's there's there are no concerns right but if we're in the 70s or 80s you know I personally you know it, it it would be nice to drive those numbers up and if we can do it in an opt-in you know encourage people to participate make it really easy to sign up if I you know we have no staffing capability to handle this at all but if we have anybody you know anybody who can can work on this and and try and drive those numbers up I've you know, the, the librarians at my kids' school are extraordinary at sending me notifications about my kids' late library books. Um, but if we can, we got to, you know, just really push that testing just over the next week or so when people are really paying attention, I think we could get to a place where we're testing so many kids that we don't need to explore other options. Um, but I hope that that's something that you can work on with your team, Dr. Bodhi, just over mm -hmm. the next week or so and, and see mm -hmm. where we're at as we explore what our other choices are. Um, so I saw Ms. Exton's hand. So Ms. Exton, go ahead. Just um, in addition to um, a response to Mr. Thielman, the other piece that I think about in increasing the participation rate is that we're about to double the density of all of the classrooms and reduce the distance between students. And I think it's going to be really, really important to really carefully surveil how has this affected the transmission of the virus or, or are our schools, you know, still all the other mitigation that um, tools that are in effect, you know, the masking, the ventilation, going outside as much as possible, are those things enough? Um, and I just, the more that we participate, the more people who participate in the testing, the better information we have about what's happening inside the schools as we bring all of the students back fully in person. Um, Mr. Thielman, and then- Yeah, you know, I just want to say, I agree that the more people we test, the better. I'm not trying to say we not test, I'm saying I'm concerned about, I, I, I'll be curious to hear what town council says about a mandate. Um, and anytime you go down the path of a mandate, um, you do invite some opposition. So I, I think the way we're doing it now, we're, 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 we're trying to, we're persuading people and we're advocating for it and we're telling people it's in everyone's best interest and it's to everyone's benefit, uh, seems like the right way to go. Uh, but um, and so I, that's the only point I wanna make is that a mandate is a tricky thing, but I'm interested in hearing what an attorney says. Dr. Bodhi. Just one last comment for parents who may be listening this evening. Um, I know there was some concern perhaps of taking away from uh, time on in learning, but I have to say this has become, we've become so efficient at this. In an elementary classroom, it takes five minutes. Yes, we're gonna double the numbers, but the, the nurses and principals said they don't expect that this to really change very much because the children self-administer the, the swabs. And we have our middle school principals and assistant principals here tonight. And I, I know that they can talk about how efficient it is in the middle schools as well. So um, we're finding that, you know, there is no, there's minimal, minimal impact on learning time with our program. Great. 
So I think what I'll plan to do is have this on the agenda in two weeks time. You can let your team know that, you know, this is something that we're, um, you know, that we're looking at and we're, um, you know, really want to see encouragement of people to sign up over the next week or so. Um, so we can, you know, get to a place where um, we're seeing, you know, higher, let's just say higher than 80, I mean, 87% is great, but sort of an average participation rate um, of, of above 87% and see if we can drive that up. Um, but, you know, also concurrently explore what options we have, um, you know, if, if there comes a time where we don't feel that that's um, sufficient and um, just, you know, I think it's, it's important to understand what our, what our options are. So, um, all right, any, uh, so Dr. Bodhi, do you want to talk about quarantine protocols as well, sort of secondarily? Um, nothing really is changing uh, as we move into full-time in-person instruction than what has been in place all year. Um, when we have a positive case in a classroom, as you all know, um, some of you have experienced this, that, the, that, cohort, that is considered a cohort, the classroom, and they will be um, learning from home for 10 days. Uh, some of you have also experienced learning communities where that becomes um, positive case impacts the learning community. None of that is going to change in terms of how we are going to operate with respect to um, a positive case. I think that probably my guess is one of the things you're wondering about is you know, how this is going to work with lunches as we go forward. And uh, the middle schools have been very successful in how they have organized lunches to make sure that we, we are very careful about having cohorts, um, learning communities, having lunch together. And in the planning for the elementary schools, again, the same idea that we're going to have a cohorting of classrooms as, as, uh, as much as possible, even if we have to have two grades in the, in the cafeteria on a rainy day, there is, there's going to be a full awareness that we're not trying to have, for example, students from a couple of different fifth grade classes eating a different, you know, mixed together in the cafeteria because, um, because of that. Having said that, that uh, having talked with the, our director of um, health department and that, that when students are in a cafeteria environment for the short amount of time that they are spaced six feet apart, that the impact for identifying a much larger cohort really is not there. So while we're also trying to manage this, there's also not the concern that in the time period that they would be there having lunch six feet apart, that we would identify um, any other students other than the existing cohort classrooms that they're in. So, I do want to reassure people that just because we're coming back full time in person does not mean we're changing how we are um, uh, addressing positive cases. Great. Any questions for Dr. Bodhi on the quarantine protocols? Okay. Um, so return to school, full return to school planning, um, Dr. Bodhi. And then we, there was a motion for this that was sent out earlier as well. So we want to make sure that we take care of that, but let's, let's get the update first. Well, I will talk about elementary and the high school later, but we have our, um, our principal Maringer and uh, principal Pierre Maxwell here today, as well as our assistant principal who will get uh, you know, introduced uh, when they speak. So I'm really, I'm going to have them um, talk a, more about some of the issues in their schools and some of the work they're doing and, and for, in planning. As you know, from the last school committee meeting, um, um, both, Gibbs and Austin presented 
their working plans, some of the issues that they have to address, and they're different now from both schools. And that, that work has been going on and will continue. Um, as you know from the state, middle schools must return in person full time uh, by April 28th. Uh, a decision has been made on um, that we are in Amazon is that both middle schools will actually start full time on Tuesday, April 27th. And we're asking the school committee tonight to approve a planning day for Monday, April 26th. So these, these, both of these are after April vacation. And the reason why we're recommending starting on Tuesday is that the fourth quarter begins on Monday. Now that's different for the middle schools and the high school, but we can talk more about that um, when actually a little bit today, but more of the next uh, school committee meeting. So I'm, I'm here tonight, um, as I said, it, Principal Maringer and Principal Pierre Maxwell, and I, Mr. Maringer is going to start uh, presenting um, where they are in some of their, in their working plans for opening. Great, thanks everyone. Um, also with me is Ms. Rubino, who is the seventh grade assistant principal and Ms. McEwen, who is the eighth grade assistant principal. So Rochelle and Julia, if I miss any talking points, help me out here tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you an update. Um, so we were here last week and we kind of rolled out some of the challenges that we were gonna have at the Audison Middle School. I think we've made some progress this week. So I did meet with the Director of Facilities, Greg Walters and Fergal O'Brien. This, um, this week, we went through some of the unused rooms just to make sure that the ventilation is good. They're getting a report back to me. They went through the building with some text, just making sure that the ventilation system is uh, up to par. So I will be getting some information. We will be having 17 teachers who have been teaching remotely this year back in the building the day after April break. So we do have a good amount of teachers coming back to the building. We did uh, finish the survey to find out how many students wanted to come back from the full remote academy back to in-person learning. We had 33 families reach out. So we have 33 students coming back. We had two students that chose to be all remote. So we're having 31 students kind of as a net gain coming back to in-person learning. From a logistical standpoint, um, this is good news for us because we're able to accommodate all 31 students in our present learning community structure. So the three learning teams that we will have right now that have been remote right along, they will stay remote. The schedules for those children will not change. So they're relatively not impacted by 31 of their classmates coming in for in-person learning for the five days. I have met with members of the IT uh, department and they're going over just how to load some new classes. We're gonna have to make sure that we have a new schedule because as I said last time, we're moving from six periods to our more traditional seven periods, which is what the remote Academy has been on um, right along. So our next step for scheduling wise is now that we know how many learning communities we're having, how many kids that we're gonna have in the building is to make sure that we're moving kids around so that they get all the classes that they need. Um, we, we are very fortunate. Um, I know we've talked about lunch before. We are pretty fortunate at the Audison to have two large gyms. So we will be able to have lunch inside when needed. Um, we also have some space out there. So we were fortunate this week to be Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We had lunches outside. We will be eating outside pretty much anytime it's 50 degrees or above. We're outside and that's kind of our, our make or break point. And so hopefully we're out there consistent. Lunch is going to switch from 40 minutes to about 23 minutes in the schedule. Kids will notice that right away. Um, but it's also kind of less time for the kids to be in 
um, all together eating lunch, which I think is um, safer. Um, we are looking at various things. I know Kevin Cummings, who is our lead PE teacher, has gotten touch with the town. We're going to use some town fields for PE so we can also have classrooms out a little bit more often at the Audison. So one of the things that Dr. Bodie did say is getting that Monday uh, when we come back from April vacation um, as a professional day. And there's, um, I'm a big proponent on it for many reasons. So first of all, one of the things the custodians are going to be really doing during April break is they're going to be moving a lot of desks. We have 12 desks in most all of our rooms. We're gonna to need to have anywhere between 20 and 24. We do have community ed that's in the building at that time. Um, so the custodians are gonna to have to kind of work around them, but also make sure that all the rooms are set up and ready to go. Um, we definitely wanna give time for those 17 teachers who are coming back in the building to be able to set up their rooms. It is a new start. It's the first day of the fourth quarter. So all specials classes has changed, which means in itself, all schedules have changed. We have 30 students who are new to the building. We'd like to offer them some time to get in on that Monday. I believe we have 16 students who are in seventh grade who have never been in a day for the Audison. We would like them to be able to come in and hopefully decrease their anxiety of coming in. From a purely teacher's perspective, they're gonna to have to recreate all their Google Classrooms. They're also gonna to have to make sure that all of their grades transfer because grades are due right before April vacation. And when you switch classes, a lot of times you have to make sure that in your system, you've also transferred those kids. So there's some tech work that needs to be done as well. I guess I'm looking at this as like a reopening. And at the beginning of the year, you have two days in which teachers are back in the building preparing. And I think we might need some of that as well. I wanna make sure all the schedules are all set. We've copied off the schedules. It's not uncharacteristic that you have kids the first day of school, usually right after Labor Day, who have a glitch in their schedule or might need some help finding somewhere. We don't want that to happen. Like we want this to be as professional and as, as just locked up as possible for the safety of our staff and our students. And that's why I think that one day after April break, teachers are in the rooms, setting up, meeting, planning, changing their Google Classrooms, making sure that everything is all set administratively, it allows us to have some time and have kids in the building. So that is, that is why I'm hoping that we'll be able to have that Monday. And then it means that we don't have a Monday, Tuesday, cohort A, cohort B starting Wednesday. I'm thinking that we just have, have that day and then Tuesday we're raring to go. Any questions? Questions from Mr. Marringer, Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to say thank you for all your work and your team's work. I don't envy you. It's real easy to say, do something and then walk away and have every, you folks have to do it. You've done a great job. A couple of quick questions. You mentioned the idea of using the gym, uh, for the gyms for lunch. Is that gonna mess up the PE schedule? If you have a, if you have a rainy day or something like that? No, we're because we're fortunate that we have both the wood gym and the blue gym and the cafeteria, we're not going to have to use the blue gym to have students eat. We currently do right now, um, but we will be able to reconfigure lunch. So right now we have a seventh grade and an eighth grade lunch. We're actually going to have three lunches now. And because we can divide the blue, the wood gym, there's a huge divider in there. We can make two rooms with the cafeteria. So if it is raining, all three teachers will be able to use the blue gym. And as luck would have it for the PE teachers, it can be divided into three different rooms with wood dividers. So right. we've actually gotten, I mean, I, I know a lot of schools lunches is, is challenging, one of the real benefits of the Audison is having two very large gymnasiums in which we can have kids for lunch and pee. My other question is uh, lunch. Uh, you've always got the student that uh, does more like me, 
too much talking and enough, not enough chewing. You're now almost cutting the, the lunch period in half. You've got a large facility getting children from point A to, to lunch. I, is this gonna cause a major problem? I don't think so. So they're going back to their regular lunch time. Um, Julie will tell you, I think that, you know, it's from, from most of us, we've enjoyed a longer lunch if you're the faculty, uh, but we're going back to our usual schedule. And okay. we, I, the custodians have done a great job. They set up little tables outside. So the kids just go outside, grab their lunch, and um, are ready to go. I actually think some of the kids, we have 40 minute lunches. I think it's actually five or 10 minutes too long. I think the kids kind of get antsy and I think it will be better actually when you have the, the shorter lunches. I think the staff has enjoyed the longer um, lunches. As someone who does lunch duty, I'm looking forward to the shorter lunches, um, but overall, I think it's plenty of time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. I, first of all, Mr. Marringer, congratulations on all the trophies behind you there. Is that, that, is that from like men's league basketball? It's that okay. is none. That is all my kids. <laughs> okay. I, I have some like small little plaque in the corner. Like I, I saw that. I said, you know, if I won trophies in men's league, I'd put them, I'd put them up to. No, no, no. Those are uh, all, those are all my kids. All right. Cool. 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 But thank you for noticing. <laughs> So I, I just want to say, uh, congratulate, you know, I like your energy, how positive you are. And it seems to me like you have a very sound plan to get the school back to, 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 to in person. So the only thing I want to say is my compliments for the work you're doing and your leadership. Uh, I've read some of the communications. They're very clear, very concise. So congratulations. Well, you know, thank you for the compliments. I appreciate that. I have two great uh, assistant uh, principals who are in the building and Maureen Murphy also helps me with the remote. Um, I would say they are uh, fantastic in editing and writing half the stuff that I put out there. Um, so they've done a great job and the staff has been fantastic as well. Um, you know, I was real happy when we did some of the vaccinations to see the teachers support each other and go around the building and help each other. I, I mean, I think that the teachers are, are, are tired. I think they have done a tremendous job, but I think they've been like the backbone and it's been nice going into the building this year because the staff has just worked so hard. So um, I, I think, you know, the staff and the assistants have done a real great job and made us all look, you know, as good as we can. Great, thank you very much. And congrats on all the trophies. Yeah, I'll tell my kids. <laughs> great, anybody else for Mr. Marringer? We definitely, you know, I, I have a, an eighth grader at the Audison and, uh, you know, there was definitely times when I was in elementary school where the narrative about the Audison was that people were worried and they didn't know and and how it was going to be. And, and now I feel like the Audison has been sort of become like the darling of the Arlington Public Schools a little bit, like especially in COVID times. And uh, and I think it's really just um, the communication has been outstanding. We appreciate um, the messaging. We appreciate you coming here to share with us. Um, and we know that if you know, if we have questions, they will be, um, they will be answered. So um, I think the, the other piece, so um, can we have a motion on the, I got to pull it up here. Ms. Fitzgerald typed it up. So or somebody typed it up. So um, to approve the planning day on Monday, April 26 for the Gibbs and Audison staff and for the return of all students for full-time in-person learning on Tuesday, April 27th, 2021. So moved. I just, okay, I have a question. I got okay. and I have a question also. Discussion. Let's, see if, let's see if there's a second and then you second. can. Okay, uh, motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hainer. Mr. Thielman, discussion. Well, it was actually a point of order. I was wondering, aren't we gonna hear from the uh, Gibbs principal first, then vote on this motion? I, you know, we should actually, I am yeah. sorry, Madame Pierre Maxwell, that was harsh. <laughs> Um, I yes, yeah. we absolutely yeah. should. So uh, yeah. let's, Mr. Schuchman, are you okay with with um, tabling your motion so that we can hear from Madame Pierre Maxwell and Ms. Salvatore, and then take it up? Madame Pierre Maxwell is certainly within the scope of the motion, so I don't see a need to withdraw it. I think we can just enjoy the presentation. Great. 
All right. Um, Madame Pierre Maxwell, tell us about the Gibbs, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I did think Dr. Bodhi and Mr. Merringer did a great job. I, I didn't need to speak for you to pass the motion, but I will present. Um, so thank you everyone for giving us an opportunity to give you an update to where we are. I'm here tonight with Ms. Salvatore, our assistant principal at the Gibbs, and we're happy to fill you in. So uh, like uh, the Audison, we also sent out a survey and uh, it was closed this afternoon at 5 p.m. Uh, we have a total of 26 parents who have selected to move from the remote program to the in-person program. And currently three parents from the hybrid program would like to go to the remote program. That said, we also have a few other uh, duplicates and several answers that we need to check to make sure that we are clear. These are the actual numbers, but the clear numbers are 26 remote, two in-person and three hybrid to remote. Hopefully when I see you in two weeks, the numbers do not change, but we do need to check in with some of our parents. Um, the building is ready. Based on those numbers, it would not create any challenges to sit all of our students because in fact, it would be a total of 23 students moving in. If you subtract the three that would be moving from hybrid to remote. Um, the last time uh, we presented, we had a, a chair issues desk looking at uh, being able to sit everyone if we were at maximum, if we had a big transition from the remote to the hybrid program, that issue is resolved. We did receive an extra 139 desks from one of the elementary schools that we will be using. So um, on the 2nd of April, uh, our uh, head custodian planned to re-measure all the classroom and add all the desks based on the number we will have in every classroom. So we will know if we'll still be able to have the children have enough desks for the cafeteria in the gymnasium. But that said, we have purchased yoga mat for every student for uh, sitting inside or outdoor when weather is nice for them to be able to eat outside. So it, whichever way it turns out, we'll be able to um, accommodate the children to eat indoor or outdoor. It looks like the gymnasium will be available to be used for PE first, second block, and then a fifth and sixth block, but not third and fourth, which is the time we'll get ready to serve lunch. So the children will be in there at that time. We're not able to not use both location, the cafeteria and the gymnasium uh, to serve. We need both location to be able to uh, serve three lunches for, for the period of time. We have not enjoyed a 40 or 45 minutes lunch. It's been 25 minutes at the Gibbs, so, and it will remain the same. Um, the facilities look great. We also had a, a, a walk with Mr. Mason and Mr. Walters. We're still waiting just on two classroom to confirm that it's safe to transition Mr. Hem, our music teacher, back to the music room. And we have a, a DML classroom that's at the bottom of the mezzanine from the media center. It's just two rooms we need to clear. Otherwise, we're all set and ready to go from a bit building uh, perspective. Uh, band chorus and orchestra is remaining in the afternoon, uh, really uh, allowing us to be able to continue to service the students and receive their lessons for the end of the school year. Um, Today we had, uh, this week we had two very productive, productive conversation uh, planning for the reopening. One with our uh, special education teacher liaison and, and all the service providers. Yesterday we spent some quality time looking at services for students. What would that look like within our schedules? So uh, there's still some challenges, but it's clear what we need to do. So we have all hands on deck, everyone is working on that. Uh, we are very hopeful that it will be smoothed out and every student will be able to get most of their classes without having to remove too many things from their uh, schedule, such as uh, them missing their ELC classes, et cetera. 
today we had a great conversation with our social emotional learning staff looking at things such as transition for the students, uh, preparation for when they come together as a team, uh, having a forum for parents, uh, anticipating all the piece that will make the students feel at ease and removing any kind of SEL issues we need to be mindful of before we bring the students together. So um, we're going to continue to do the work and then plan for it, but I, I am very hopeful. Uh, Ms. Salvatore is all hands on deck looking at our schedule from what was presented, what were the challenges yesterday. I don't know if she wants to speak to that a little bit. <laughs> So, but we are in a good place overall. We're looking forward to uh, fielding some questions from parents also before we return. So when we meet with them, we've selected a date for the parents. It's going to be April 8th. We'll be meeting with parents. And then after that, we will share what date we'll do a greet and meet for our students from the remote program who's never been in the building. So they'll have a tour and then we can get them a acquainted a little bit with the building before they return, uh, they join us um, for the uh, in-person program. Thank you for listening. Uh, questions for Madame uh, Pierre Maxwell. I'm gonna let Dr. Bodhi go first and then take questions from the committee. So Dr. Bodhi. It's not a question. I just want to compliment uh, both of our principals and teams on this. I will say that uh, they're sort of underplaying how much work, I wouldn't say underplaying, but there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, one of the things as was mentioned last meeting is that it's, it's it's going to be necessary to do a lot of hand scheduling, particularly at Oz. And we certainly um, worked with, um, they, they have worked with IT, have tried to look at every which way they can do a proxy schedule, dummy schedule, to, in order that we at least can get a schedule in place. But then after that, there's still hand scheduling. So they have a lot of work yet to do, but I think that you can see from the last meeting how much progress has been made. And um, we'll give you, if there's any updates we need to give to you, we'll certainly do that before um, they begin um, on April 27th. So I wanna thank them all for this and the teaming that's going on between the two schools is, is very high. And that's also important for people to know as well. Great, uh, questions for Madame Pierre Maxwell about the Gibbs, Mr. Thielman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Paramax, for the presentation. It was very helpful. I just want to clarify. I heard. I want to make sure I heard this correctly. I saw your presentation. This the PowerPoint beforehand. So the remote, the number of students studying remotely is going to stay roughly the same, 150 or so. That is that correct? Yes, about 125, 125. right now. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's going okay. Um. <clears throat> all right. There, I'm going to ask this question. Several parents, a few parents, have have inquired as to whether or not the middle school can open the uh, the Gibbs Gibbs Middle School can open uh, on April 5th, along with the K through five school. And I just wanted to know what your response would be to that question. We do have a lot of paperwork to do in in regard to looking at our students who receive services to make sure that it's well thought out and that some of them have at least three or four different type of services throughout the day. So that's still in the making. I'm not sure if we could get all this done effectively and then hold parent forums and do an orientation for our students. We don't have 17 staff who's moving from the uh, remote to in-person, but we do have 10 staff coming in. So uh, at, a, at some degree, the same movement and tasks that's happening at Audison is happening at Gibbs. We had the advantage of a schedule that falls in better, but it doesn't really remove the same steps that we're taking at Audison is happening at Gibbs. It's just from a different perspective. Okay, all right, thank you very much. You're welcome. And I would just concur with- Sorry, Madame. Ms. Salvatore, go ahead. I would just concur with Madame Pierre Maxwell that while it's not as much, there's still quite a bit 
that we need to do and to say that we'd be ready in a week is is not fair i don't think at this point okay Great. thanks uh, um other questions about the gibbs Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, more discussion on Mr. Schlickman's motion around um, April 26th for a planning day. So, I just want to clarify um, this a planning day for the Gibbs and Audison staff means not a school day for students, <laughs> right? So let's like, we, I wanna make that really, I'm fine with the motion as is, but you know, to those who are watching, um, uh, you know, that it, it would not be a school day for students the Monday after April vacation. And then all students would return to school, um, would return to full in-person school on Tuesday, April 26th. Um, which is one day earlier than has been, than had been communicated previously. So um, I guess my, the discussion that I would want to have on this motion is I would just want to know that um, should this be approved by the committee this evening, that communication would go out to families about it uh, tomorrow on Monday, I don't know, sometime very soon so that people understand and can be ready to plan for that. So that's my only um, discussion on that. Mr. Hainer and then Dr. Bodie. I just want to make sure everyone's clear. This is a planning day for the Audison and Gibbs only. The LMA, it'll be a regular school day for the uh, K to five. I don't want to miscommunicate that. It will be. Uh, and yep. I hope we, as somebody who has kids at a lot of levels, I'm, I am on board for this for April, 2021 and never ever again, because this is total pandemonium for families who have kids at different levels. It's not pleasant, but I appreciate it's what we need to do right now, but I hope we are never in a situation again where we are bifurcating professional development days because it's um, all right, Dr. Bodhi. Um, thank you to Mr. Hainer for, for um, clarifying that. And I think that that needs to go out to the whole district on this. I will do that. The principals will also let their respective communities know. But one additional thing about this is that we are still, we are still being held to the 171 days this year. So that means that our middle school students like our elementary students will have their last day of school, knock on wood, barring any new snowstorms, on uh, Thursday, uh, June 24th. Great. Any more uh, discussion on this motion? Uh, Mr. Schlickman and then Ms. Keyes. Of course, we're not going to have any more snowstorms. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I just think that the planning on the part of uh, our two principals and their staff has been extraordinary. This isn't an easy thing to do, and I congratulate them on, on making this progress and hope uh, if they need anything else, we've got another meeting uh, in the beginning of April. Please come talk to us if you need anything. Ms. Keys. I'm only making this comment to save you a thousand emails later. You are returning all in-person students to full-time learning, not all students. Our remote academies are going to continue to exist through the end of the school year. Thank you. Indeed. For those students participating in in-person learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more on this? All right, uh, motion by Mr. Schlickman, uh, seconded by Mr. Hainer, Ms. Exton. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, Mr. Cardin, go ahead. Yeah, so that I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, you're down we'll use there that. at Gallon School at the bottom right. of the screen, and it's hard to <laughs> yeah. see you. Tell sorry, that. um, no, just just to clarify that you're you, you're even though Ms. Keys is is uh, not a member, you're accepting that as a friendly amendment to the motion, right? I it's am accepting the, it's that as a friendly amendment uh, to the motion. Amendment it's the motion the that's mis it's the motion that's misworded. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, she's uh, not here. Um, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. 
Yes. And I am also yes. Good night. Um, okay. Any more uh, conversations about full return about uh, full return planning? Mm -mm. Ms. Exton, go ahead. I, I have a I have a question that has come up in some of our school committee chats and from other parents, and I'm just wondering if we can get some clarification. What are the um, the expectations for students who are quarantined, but are not with their, but not with their cohort. So for example, my son this week was a close contact from something outside of school. So he didn't go to school this week. What, um, what is that? Cause that's gonna become five, six, seven days for kids as opposed to the two now. What should families expect students to receive during that time? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, our students all have um, access to Google Classroom and just if, as if they were sick themselves, um, which happens during the winter, they will receive assignments um, through Google Classroom. Um, yes, that is one of the uh, combining with returning for the students that are gonna be returning um, with our quarantine, yes, that, that is going to be uh, an issue for some of our students that, that unless their cohort is also in, in a remote for 10 days, in that situation, they will be getting remote instruction. We, we can and will shift to remote in those situations. If it's a, if it's a child that uh, is, has had been in close contact from actually even in school or from an outside, yes, that is going to be an issue in terms of getting assignments. And that's how we're, we're going to be able to do it. They are not going to be able to join a remote academy class. Those are classrooms with, you know, uh, with a defined group of kids. So that is one of the disadvantages. And that's one of the reasons we want to also keep uh, our students as safe as possible to avoid that as much as possible. Okay. So, so then there was the other piece to the question um, is, should families be concerned about, um, about attendance? And I, my, my understanding is that this year there's sort of some um, leeway with the attendance um, because of these kinds of issues, like it's not necessarily a truancy thing that in other years would be considered. No, thank you. It's it's not at all. You know, if the student is um, out of school due to a contact in school, it's very clear, you know, that that's an excused absence, not an issue. The same thing would be true in the situation where um, a student has been identified as a close contact from another in another venue. Same thing. Um, no, we're not going to do that. But what is important is that the parents communicate with the um, the principal, the school nurse, um, one or the other, to make sure that everyone is aware of the situation, and that way uh, it can be um, taken care of in in power school. And I don't know if you know one of our principals would want to comment any further in terms of the technical pieces of this. But um, yes, this is a different year and we are not going to have the same, if you're out, you know, five days, eight days, that is not going to trigger anything. Thank you. And Dr. Bodhi, I had just, and then Mr. Cardin, one other question. Um, what do you happen to have, or if you don't have them right now, if you could send to the committee, I'm curious about the, um, the numbers of students. So we have the, the, the net change at the Gibbs and the Audison that we got from um, Madame Pierre Maxwell and Mr. Meringer. Do you know what the net change was or the out in numbers for uh, K-5? I do. In fact, I was going to, uh, as part of this planning, remember I said we'll do the elementary Oh yeah. Okay. So I will, I would like to hold my question because you're ahead of me. So I'm going to call on Mr. Cardin and we'll get to that when we get there. Thank okay. you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, my question was about the high school. So I think she's getting to that. So I'll hold my question. Okay. Thanks. Anything else on six, seven and eight only. 
All right, seeing none, I am trying to be better about releasing our um, administrative team. So um, Ms. Rabino and Ms. McEwen and Ms. Salvatore and Mr. Maringer and Madame Pierre Maxwell, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your excellent information. Um, as always, it's a pleasure uh, to see you and uh, thanks, for, thanks for everything. So have a great night. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, do you want to go on to do elementary and then the high school? Yes. Um, at the elementary, I know that you're interested as we we were too, because the impact of, of how many students are going to be returning mm -hmm. uh, from the remote academy to in-person is significant in all of our planning. Um, total there in the, all of our seven elementary, there are 80 students that are returning uh, from the remote academy to, um, to back to a full-time in-person. We have two students that are moving from the in-person to remote. Now, the, the, we also have, um, we had 24 students who could not be placed in the same in their home grade home school. And they were offered a different um, school, same grade, of course. And we had only of the 24, three that agreed to uh, be placed in another school. Now, of the 80, and that incorporates that, of the 80, it's pretty, it's pretty distributed throughout all of our schools, as well as grades. Um, and I've confirmed that with um, the, uh, the people who kept all the spreadsheets and all of the different uh, places that students were um, being placed. So uh, like if you, if you think of this proportionally, and we actually have fewer elementary students per school uh, returning from remote than we even do at each of the middle schools, which actually was a surprise to us, to be perfectly honest. We thought that there would be a greater return, um, particularly at our early grades. And I will say that there was more at the early grades and, and that's actually where we had some uh, more space problems in terms of students um, being placed in the home school. But we did make the offer. Uh, there was a, um, and, and so we're pretty, pretty subtle right now on this number. So planning is going forward, which uh, the, this affects, of course, class sizes, but even more so um, our specialist schedules and number of sections we need to have and all of the things that go into um, scheduling. As, as Madame Pierre Maxwell mentioned, you know, scheduling all the special education services, ELL, that we, we need to reschedule. I will say that there's been a, a major effort to make sure that we disrupt those as, as little as possible. Though truthfully, I'm not sure that that can be entirely accomplished, um, but certainly the effort is being made to have that happen. So all of those uh, schedules are in the process of being uh, done. And as you know, there's a planning day uh, that's going to occur on April 1st for our elementary schools. So that will go out as a reminder to everyone as well. But I, I, this has been helpful information uh, for planning and that's where we are in that regard. Um, we met, well, we meet every week actually, but we, this week we, we have focus on um, you know, lunch planning. There's just a lot of details uh, to go into that, but I will say that we are in good shape in our elementary schools and the planning and Another thing that may not be as obvious in this return to um, in-person full time is the, you know, the attention to curriculum and pacing guides that have to take place. And so all that is going on as well. Um, so that we're ready for the for April 5th. Now we do have some students that um, that will be returning and individual schools are going to be able, to uh, you know, work with these students who may have never stepped foot in a school, um, but they're very few in our um, numbers. So mm -hmm. it um, can be handled on a, an individual basis. 
So that's sort of a broad view. I don't know if you have any questions. We can certainly, um, if you do, and there's things that I can't answer, we'll, we'll ask some of our elementary principals to come to the next meeting for updates on how, how, the, transition, uh, how the transition went. So with that, if there's any questions about elementary. Great, I just wanted to clarify the numbers. So 80 are coming in person. Three of, three of the 80 are not coming to their, their original sending school or presumably if they're kindergartners, their districted buffered, you know, whatever school, right? But, but 104 or 101 of them, 101 people, 101 students requested to come back, but some number of them didn't because they weren't assigned. They weren't gonna be able to come to their sending school. That's correct. Okay. And so we have two that are, that are going from to the remote academy. Correct. Got it. So uh, just like the middle schools, we are not going to need to change um, our remote academy, uh, which is something that was something that might be necessary. I will say there is one additional section we've had to create at Hardy. Uh, those numbers in that classroom were already at max capacity and then some. So there was only one class, but we were able to, um, we had a teaching assistant who was uh, certified and we were able to have a very smooth transition. And that person had already been working with the fourth and fifth grade. So we're in good shape in that regard as well. Great. Um, so questions for Dr. Bodhi on uh, K-5. Uh, high school, Dr. Bodhi? Um, I have probably less to report on that. We, um, the, the, Dr. Janger would like to come and present at the next school committee meeting where he will have much more of a plan to give to all of you. Um, right now, it still remains uh, the intent of the Department of Education that they will give districts two weeks notice and not in in, in April, that is not changing. So that's really not a possibility to go with that kind of notice to uh, changing your schedule in the high school. Um, right now, as you know, we have the departmental shift, but in having our students come back um, across the board in, in the current schedule, it, it means many things, um, some of which you've already I heard from the middle school. So that planning has already started. And one of the things that uh, we also need to know is something similar to the middle schools and the elementary is how many students um, would choose to be um, entirely remote. Right now, some, something like 300 students will not come in on the days that there's a departmental shift. And that number of around 20% has remained pretty constant. So the expectation is that's probably where the number will be. And, um, but, we, but I think that the high school wants to get some surety about that. The other thing that's complicated for the high school is how they do MCAS and how they're gonna have that be sort of at the same time as the AP, some of the AP exams are in the, in the building and some are remote. Um, they're not all remote, which is another um, issue in the, all this planning. So that's basically where we are. And uh, I know that they're, they're thinking about, you know, setting perhaps their own date at which they come back and not wait for the Department of Education to only give them two weeks notice. So I can tell you more about that um, when we, at the next school committee meeting, and certainly we can give you as much information ahead of time so you're aware. But I, I, I think it's gonna take these next couple of weeks to really um, get a little bit more surety to where the high school is. Great, questions for Dr. Bodie about the high school, Mr. Hainer. Did I understand you to say that uh, with the current uh, 
schedule that they have right now, if the state, if Desi turns around and says, you've got to bring them back in for full time, it won't, it, they can't do it? Oh, no, that's not what I'm saying. They're planning, let me be really clear. The high school is planning to come back full time. Okay. That's not the issue. It's that they can't wait for the Department of Education in April. Okay, thank you. So you have to be back in two weeks. Right. Now, the earliest I think the department would say would be right after vacation, uh, just like the middle schools. But uh, superintendents asked that question this week of the commissioner and had nothing more, they said nothing more than, I've already said it will be in April, the decision. And yes, it'll only give you two weeks notice. So if it's in April, two weeks notice probably means um, it's possible that's right after vacation uh, that that would occur. But thank you. Please know the high school is planning around returning full time. We are not thinking of applying for a waiver. Mr. Thielman? That's the question I was going to ask, and Dr. Bodie answered it. We're not planning on a waiver. So in two weeks, when Dr. Janger comes, we'll hear a proposal, we'll hear a plan to reopen, and then we can respond to it. Okay. Exactly so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, anything else generally about full return planning? All right, seeing none, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The next item on the agenda is um, is EDCO. We uh, are here at the, um, so the uh, possible motion, should somebody choose to make it, is that the Arlington School Committee supports the vote of the EDCO Board of Directors to begin the termination process for the EDCO Collaborative in order to dissolve the collaborative as of June 30th, 2022. So move. Second. All right, discussion. Seeing none. Um, all right, let's vote. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Abstain. Dr. Allison Ampey is not here. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's FY22 budget for approval, which we have discussed um, on several occasions and um, the budget subcommittee met on Tuesday. It's been a bit of a blur. Um, Mr. Cardin, would you, I'm putting you on the spot here now. Uh, would, given that Dr. Allison Ampey is here, would you be able, not here, would you be able to give us a brief recap of that meeting uh, before we um, vote on the budget? Uh, sure, although um, I think for the purpose of the, of the public, it might be easier if I defer to Mr. Mason to discuss the highlights of the changes. Um, but there were some significant changes made in the budget, which Mr. Mason, I hope you can you can walk us through. They're, you're in, they're in your cover email, but um, just for the public. Um, uh, and I think the subcommittee was fine with those. We now have uh, a large number of reserve positions, 10, uh, which is good for the flexibility that we need with enrollments being so uncertain. But um, it was the uh, will of the committee, of the subcommittee to uh, keep tabs on that very closely in the spring to make sure those resources are being utilized um, appropriately and, and with some oversight from the committee. So I think that was the main takeaway on the budget. Thank right, you, Jane? Mr. Cardin. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, would you like to introduce um, your budget and Mr. Mason to talk about any changes? Um, well, I would ask Mr. Mason if he could, can you share the list of changes or just speak to them? I know that you've had this in writing. Um, the, the bottom line number that we um, have we've presented has, has shifted, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, has not shifted. Uh, what has changed, and I think this is one of the major drivers of uh, the, some of the revisions is, is the amount of money that we're going to um, 
fund for out of district placements. And, you know, Mr. Mason, could you talk a, a little bit about this and then we can talk about, see if there's any questions uh, from everybody about the changes that we've, we've made. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I can, I can speak to it. Um, so as Mr. Len Cardin has um, spoke about previously, we did increase the number of reserve positions. Um, previously, we had a total of um, six reserve positions. Three were uh, general ed reserve positions, and then the other were specifically going to be dedicated to three special education reserves positions. Now that we, when we did the rollover back in January of the positions that were we were going to carry in our budget, at that time we were not we were not as certain of some of our needs and what um, school was going to look like in September. And so what was pointed out was that we did carry four additional positions from the Gibbs School. We have now changed those four positions over to reserve positions that will be, as, as uh, Len stated earlier, or Mr. Cardin stated earlier, that we will identify later in the spring, and those will be now reserve positions, making a total of 10. Also, we've made some changes into our special education out of district um, tuition um, budget in this in this proposed budget. We're reducing the special education out of district tuition by uh, 1.2 million dollars, or a little bit above that. Um, this was after uh, uh, the special education department met with the business office in regards to how we are watching uh, particular students who are identified as likely uh, are possibilities of students to be placed in an out of district placement. And after doing a historical analysis, it was determined that about 10 students per year are placed um, from this watch list that we would call it. And the watch list had several tiers to the watch list. And previously we would fund the majority of tier one in a portion of tier two on the watch list. So now it's been a change in practice, um, which then led to uh, us the ability to re reduce the special education out of district tuition, but still have some, some uh, a little buffer in case there's unexpected uh, changes. Um, we also, uh, since we were able to reduce the out of district tuition that made other funds available in the budget, which then was able to for us to increase the electric electricity and natural gas budgets to 260 by two hundred sixty thousand dollars, um, which should be able to fully support those expenses on the general fund appropriation and think about using other funds that are collected from different revolving which we normally would place some utility costs to be used for different projects to support our facilities. Um, department budgets um, were also were able to increase across the board using this additional money. Uh, before we were level funding the other department budgets, so we'll now be able to uh, uh, increase department budgets over $700,000. And then there was a minor adjustment uh, that was uh, a, re a reallocation of, of a grant, um, which was a, uh, incorrect number that was put in due to a, a formula and that showed a reduction in PD uh, that uh, in a PD program code uh, that has been changed and uh, corrected. They're still reflecting a reduction, but it's actually accurate and is not uh, the uh, as great of a reduction as we were previously reflecting. Uh, that's all the changes to the budget. Um, and I believe there was a motion uh, provide it to the school committee uh, for the budget transfer categories uh, to the vote on, which is included in this budget document. Uh, and I will keep back to Dr. Bodie. Uh, this might be a good point to mention uh, where we stand with enrollment for next year because it does relate to the reserve positions. So I know many of you are familiar that in some elementary schools, it's, it's pretty consistent. You have three or you have four per grade.
But there are also schools, even with that consistency, where you might have four in one grade and three in another. So when that grade moves forward, you know, you you're going to move a teacher. But if you then remain with an expanded number of kindergartens, you have to add a teacher. So we, right now, it's looking like we could have two or possibly three of schools in that situation. Um, right now, um, we have 370 students that have actually completed their application. And I believe there's close to 80, um, no, more than that. Um, no, I'm sorry, there's 400 students right now. Um, 370 is where we were two weeks ago. There's 400 students right now that have completed applications and we have 78 that are pending. Now, we don't know, we don't really analyze how many of those will um, be completed, but on the other hand, what that's saying is we're tracking as in a regular school year. Um, last, last time we met, we had 370, but at that same time, the previous year, we had 435. Well, that, is, that difference between last year and this year is, is rapidly starting to change. So I, I can't tell you right now for sure, but we had only three reserve positions just for elementary. And I'm already starting to see that those are gonna be necessary. At least two of them probably are. And, and then we have to take a look at where we are, certainly at our secondary level. Um, as you know, this year, um, we had students and, and we have parents concerned about the fact that in our, uh, our four by four schedule, we had a number of students who could not get the extra classes that they wanted. That is That was certainly highlighted this year, but that's not, that's been something that's been an issue that students have not been able to necessarily get their elective classes at the high school. We have, you know, sort of been sort of behind pace in terms of what we need to do about uh, elective courses, uh, staff for elective courses. So um, I, I don't think, I think increasing beyond the three for gen ed is absolutely the right thing to do as we still trying to figure out where we're going to be in the fall. Um, I think that each month we go along, we'll be able to refine that a little bit more. And clearly if we don't need the positions, there are plenty in the five-year plan that we have not funded yet and can come back to the table and talk about what some of those priorities might be. Great, questions for Mr. Mason or Dr. Bodhi about the FY22 budget. Mr. Schlickman. Um, I am supporting these changes, but I'm also aware that there's uh, uh, funding for COVID related uh, expenses and I think that increasing enrollment and increasing needs for students moving forward would be there. So my, my core question is, I guess, philosophical rather than detailed. Uh, my assumption is that we will be coming back to think about additions to fulfill the needs that are directly related to the shutdown and return to school with supplemental money? Um, yes. In fact, one of the areas which we haven't figured out what the budget is yet is a summer, summer programming. And this week, uh, we got a little bit more clarity from the Department of Education on their expectation, which has changed from what we understood. We always have an ESY program. And this year, um, because we're ending the school year in a both an in-person and a remote model for this year, ESY, which is our special education programming in the summer at all levels, must offer both a remote and an in-person. Now we haven't figured out what that is going to, what the staffing is on that's going to be. So that's one area where ESSER money can, can be used not to mention our special, special ed budget. 
But we have, as I mentioned in, our, in the plan document I gave you two weeks ago, that we are planning on an expanded summer program for students. We had one last summer, we called it an expansive, expanded Title I program. And so we were able to fund some of it from Title I funds, but the rest of it was funded out of, jet, of operating funds. Um, the same thing as we're going to do this summer. And the question is, how expansive can we make it? And of course, that requires staffing to do that. And that those plans have already begun. Um, I can't answer right now um, uh, what that what that will look like, what will be the process. What I can say is that when we did it last summer, we used the Title I, um, not the, well, we used the Title I formula, but we, we, we looked at the students who would have been receiving Title I extra services. And we looked at the students we thought um, we were recommended they could use the additional uh, programming. Now, one of the things that we have to look at, and I really, maybe I can put this on the agenda for next time, but let me just say this. Um, we thought a week or so ago that we were gonna have to offer a summer, a summer programming in both, mo both models, in person and remote. Just this week, the department has said, you do not need to offer remote. However, what we learned last summer was we had more participation when we had it remote. So we're working through all this right now, but the short answer without getting much further in the weeds than this, is that yeah, the ESSER money will be used, a, a, a good chunk of it, how much of it will be used for summer programming to get kids ready for the fall. I also think that there's a huge need for second language students to uh, get back into the flow of learning English uh, because that's something that really requires the interaction uh, within schools. Uh, and and to have a, a robust summer program for English learners, I think is going to also be essential. And I hope that that's at the top of the list. Um, yes, as you know, we've had that kind of programming in past years and uh, for our, uh, our EL students. And that was always at Bishop. Um, last summer, we did not have it. We certainly would like to bring that back because it was a very successful program. Uh, it, it's more essential this year than ever. So uh, I, I hope that's a priority. Mr. Hainer. Um, one of the things that's consistently come up in all the, the chats and a lot of emails, parents concerned of what the, their children have lost during this year. I know it's a normal thing on a regular year pre-pandemic is to do annual assessment at the end of the year to make the determination of what each child has grown and pass that on to the, the following year's teacher. This is more, more of a need this year than anywhere else. There are students that, that potentially have not gained or would be deemed normal and need tutoring or need extra help, not in special ed, not ELL, not Title I. And there is federal money coming down. And that money needs to be, in my mind, uh, put in and invested in, in what has happened to these children. We need first off to find out what's happened and what needs to be done, whether it's just tutoring during the summer, way beyond what we've done in the past, or additional support during the fall. And uh, we need to do this as soon as possible to make this determination. This is something that parents are asking consistently across the board at all grade levels in all different groups. Um, would you, could I ask Dr. McNeil to talk about the assessment structure we have in place? Um, but I do agree with you that we, we it's not gonna be just sufficient for the summer, but for the fall as well. Um, so we're working on those plans and we can get back to you and, and you can see the progress we have been making on them. But um, do you want to hear a little bit about the kind of assessments we've been doing? I, I, I... Rick, I personally know that the teachers work very hard and do an annual assessment, and, and I know Dr. McNeil's on top of that. I'm not questioning that. I'm just want, I guess it's more for the public, for everyone to be aware that this is a unique year, and we're going to have to be looking in the budget and stuff 
to uh, expand the support for students and teachers going forward for what may have been lost. We have to first assess if there has been a loss and if there has, what are we going to do with it? I'm just presenting this. I'm not asking for any, any I don't need a response. Maybe someone else on the committee needs a response. I'll just make one comment, maybe Dr. We use uh, our, own for our own assessments to actually identify the students. And we did this last summer for the students that need that extra support. And we had, it was a five year, five week program, I, I recall, right? Uh, Dr. McGill, yeah. Um, um, I, I guess my concern is not, we have good programs in place to deal with, with the kids that we have, the special needs kids, the Title I, ELL and stuff like that. I'm talking across the board, taking the annual assessment we do for every student and what usually gets passed on to the next year's teacher to give a starting point for each of those students. We need to find out if we have actually had academic losses. And if we have, what are we going to do? One, we are assessing whether we have academic loss. And last year's program was not limited to uh, special education students with an IEP, ELL, Title I. It was much more expansive than that. So we would be using our assessments this year to identify those students um, who would benefit from a summer programming. And that's our first approach to the summer programming. And it is not, it is, it is a general ed and Title I and ELL programming. My concern is limited funding and my understanding, and I'll stand corrected, there is federal money coming to deal with the pandemic and stuff. And so I don't think we should be limited on a, fun, uh, a funding basis uh, to handle these kids. That's all. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Mr. Thielman? Uh, I kind of want to just pick up on what Mr. Hainer was saying, but the, the uh, so the stimulus money is specifically to help for reopening schools and remediation. So is there, I guess my question is to, to Dr. Bodie, is there a, a group within the, your team that is talking about how specifically how to use this money if and when it becomes available um, it, it, to do remediation with students? And like, are you think? Are you talking about thinking about the logistics of this? Who would teach? What that? What it would cost to teach? How many people yeah. you need? How many FTEs? All that stuff. That's kind of. Yeah, uh, we, we are. We we okay. are definitely doing that, and we don't have the federal money yet. In fact, I don't even think it's. I don't even think Jesse has it yet. But what I can say is that the formula is about two point two times what we got for ESSER two, which is just slightly over 500,000. So with the federal money, I, the money for the summer programming is not going to be the issue. Certainly getting staff to do it after this year is going to be an issue, but maybe we can also hire outside of our staff, but our staff is certainly first priority on this. Um, whether we're going to, uh, where we're gonna have it, uh, whether it's going to be uh, both remote and in-person. Um, I learned the other day from Mr. Mason that the Dallin Chiller has, you know, could be ready to go because I think it's going to be important if we do in-person like we do for um, our special education programs. We, we host that at Pierce and Gibbs um, just to make sure that we have a, a, a you know, an air modulated environment for them. So we are definitely working on that and uh, we'll keep you apprised of where we are in the planning. But to Mr. Hainer's point, we're using our assessments that we're doing to identify those students who would be invited to this, um, the, the summer programming. Okay. Okay, I just, I mean, I, it, it, I just want to make, I, I'm sure this not, is not going to be the case, but I just want to make sure that when and if this money comes, we have a plan in place, we're ready to go, we can execute on it and we're not scrambling at the last minute. We at least have a framework for how we're gonna do the work. Can I, well, yeah. can I interject here, um, Dr. Bodie? Um, it's fine with me, it's fine Ms. Morgan. Ms. Morgan, can I yeah, interject? Go ahead, Dr. McNeil. So sure. we have a core planning team that has already met this week and we are um, actively planning right now. We're also um, 
talking with our reading specialists, our math interventionists, our principals, our teachers, in order to make sure that we're identifying those students who can benefit from such a program. And really, it, we're going to replicate what we did last summer because we had a lot of success. Um, so we've met this week and we're going to meet again. And so we've, we're already on top of this and we realize that um, we need to make sure that we are identifying all students and not letting anyone slip through the cracks. So we are utilizing their, our assessments that we have in place that we give to all of our students. And then we're also talking to our math interventionists, our reading specialists, and um, in order to also make sure we have a comprehensive list. So I, I anticipate that funding will also not be a problem, um, but as Dr. Bodie stated, after this schooling year uh, with our staff, um, staffing may be an issue, but we're gonna do everything we can to um, make sure that we have the necessary staff that, that for the programs. And I will also say that we, all, we, we have a program going on right now from our community block grant that we offer to students within the district. And it's a tutoring, a targeted uh, tutoring program that where students are meeting with tutors after school and on the weekend uh, for that targeted assistance. So we are, we have programs going on right now and I would love to utilize that federal money if possible to maintain something year round so we can offer and replicate what we're doing with the community block grant uh, right now. So we have lots of ideas and uh, we're, we're already on top of it, planning for the, for the summer and beyond. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardin, I think you're, yeah, yep, go ahead. Sorry, yes, with the background, uh, you know, you see me waving. Um, so two points, one was at the, at the budget subcommittee meeting, we, we did mention that uh, with the past ESSER money, we've been a little bit loose as far as a committee uh, reviewing and approving the spending, but for this next tranche, uh, and also maybe for the 500,000 that looks like you're, you're planning to spend in the next fiscal year, we do want to make sure that there's a spending plan reviewed in our normal pro in our normal fashion. So we do expect the administration as as the money comes in to develop a plan uh, and have that go through the budget subcommittee and, and be reviewed by the full committee uh, later in the spring. I also just wanted to mention for uh, Mr. Mason and the admin team, that it, it's almost certain, certainly true that the town's money can be used for some of these purposes. And the town is getting, you know, 30, almost $37 million. So uh, everything should be, you know, staffing should be, finding the right staff should be the only issue, not the amount that we're spending. I mean, obviously we have to get approval for that money, but um, uh, we shouldn't be looking at 1.2 million as the ceiling. Um, you know, we, sh we, we should be able to access some of that other money if it's necessary. And it's, it's up to you to figure out what, it, what really is necessary for this, for this summer and for the fall going forward. Thank you. Can, can I also interject one more thing, ahead, Ms. Dr. Morgan? Yep. I also wanna say a large portion of that money, we, we invested heavily into online tools. So the online tools are also available for the students over the summer, all students over the summer. So everything that we purchased last year, uh, work with uh, Mr. Mason to make to ensure that the licenses the licenses that we uh, purchased will go from August to August. So all students will have access to the online tools that we invested in for this past year. So it would be something for everyone. I guess my point is is that all students will have the benefit of some type of support over the summer, and uh, that's something that I think that we did a very good job of, at doing. All right, anybody else? Okay, uh, seeing none, I am looking for a motion to approve the budget transfer categories in the superintendent's proposed FY22 budget as follows. Administration, $3,592,271. Curriculum instruction, $1,855,919. Elementary, $23,428,272. Secondary, $23,732,683. Special Education, 
other $7,544,364, grants $2,897,649. So moved. Second. Uh, any more discussion? Uh, seeing none, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Uh, anything else on the on your budget, Dr. Bodie? No, thank you for your support. Um, and from the committee? Great. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, job description that is in Novus. Uh, Mr. Cardin, would you like to tell us about uh, this from CIA? Sure. So um, this was uh, in, in the budget draft that we've seen. Uh, and at one point it was a manager, now it's called director. Um, but this is a similar position that other towns have adopted recently. Um, the position description that was uh, written by Mr. Spiegel with a lot of assistance from the entire administrative team um, includes some, some language from some of these other towns. Um, it, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's there available uh, in Novus. The committee reviewed it. Um, our only comment was to um, you know, just give it some time for either the, the uh, diversity and inclusion groups at the schools or the superintendent's diversity advisory group to uh, give any other additional input that they may have. We did meet, our meeting actually at CIA was with um, two representatives from the Human Rights Commission uh, and they uh, did want, it, want everybody to know that they're very pleased that we are adding this position, um, but they didn't have any specific comments on the language so the description is here before us and um, uh, Mr. Spiegel is uh, available, I assume, to, or Dr. Bodie to answer any questions. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mr. Cardin. Um, Dr. Bodie, is, do you have anything else you'd like to tell us about this or Mr. Spiegel before we have any kind of conversation about it? Mr. Spiegel might want to give a little bit of um, uh, feedback on what he has learned from uh, when he's put this out to the diversity group. Um, and it basically, they're also very pleased that we're doing this as well. And I think it was really just um, one or two issues. And perhaps you could talk about that, Mr. Spiegel. You're, you're muted. He can't hear you, actually. He's not muted, which is oh, weird. No. We can't hear him. He broke. He doesn't have his ear. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Just was on the, I'm still on my headphone mic um, and I'm not on my headphone. So um, they, so we did get some feedback. There were some questions about the, the requirement for the licensure. Um, and it was it, when you know, we, we met with the central office, you know, we thought that it was appropriate for the person who would hold this position because it's in an education in a school setting in the in the district to have an educator license. Um, there were some questions about whether that would preclude certain applicants. Um, so we did amend that a little bit to to say that you you know, have a license or be eligible for licensure within the first year. One of the concerns we've had in sort of some experience we've had in the past with the Mass Teachers Retirement System is that when uh, a job description doesn't require a license and someone has a license, it could be, um, they might not be eligible to contribute to mass teachers and they could be coming from another district or they have, may have been in a position in a district where they have been contributing to mass teachers retirement and it would not be really, they would not want to leave the mass teachers retirement system if they've been in it and, and putting money into it. They could, if they couldn't go into mass teachers, they go into the town retirement system and there are a few differences. I mean, there, there, but I think most people who are educators would prefer to be in the mass teachers retirement system. So that's why um, we have that in there. I think we really, um, and I think the state this year, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has made it um, 
has opened up avenues toward licensure for people who don't have a license. Uh, and it's good for the next year. There's something called an emergency license where someone who has a, a bachelor's degree um, can apply for an educator license um, uh, under the emergency license and they can, um, they can get that. And then they have that for another year. It will be good until June of 2022. And then they would have to take MTELs and get a, a regular license. But I think that's a reasonable expectation for someone who works in a school district. So um, in this type of position that is really working with educators directly in educational uh, programming. So th that was the, um, the biggest uh, question that they had. And then, um, you know, the, 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 it was sent out to the DIG, uh, the DIGS and the uh, Human Rights Commission as well. Great, thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Uh, comments from the committee on the job description, Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to commend Mr. Spiegel. Uh, I've been following all the uh, emails going back and forth from the different groups and he responded very quickly and very clearly with them uh, and all the questions. I have only one comment to make on this um, and I realize budgets are tight and everything, but I think the salary range on this is on the low end and we want to get a quality person. And I would recommend to uh, change it up to uh, at least $125,000 at the top end. I'll leave the bottom end wherever they want it. That's a recommendation that I would offer it as a friendly amendment to the uh, passing of this. Uh, discussion? Mr. Schlickman? If that's an amendment, I'd support it. And if he made it formally, I'd second it. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I move that we approve the uh, job description as presented with uh, being amended on the uh, on the salary range to go as high as $125,000. And I second that. Great. Uh, discussion on uh, the motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman. Dr. Bodie. Well, I just want to comment that this was done with a, a lot of thought in terms of the context of where salaries are for administrators in the district. And so the salary range uh, was selected in that regard. Um, if I were to make a, a, a suggestion, I can't make an amendment that I thought maybe going up to 120 might be reasonable, but um, I think that going higher than that is not in line with other salaries. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, first off, this is a brand new position. It's a district-wide position. And uh, I made that suggestion to be uh, uh, competitive with other districts around. Uh, we've, we've been looking to do that across the board as, as different salaries have come in. This position is unique. It is going to be highly sought after throughout many districts. And uh, I want us to be uh, there, to be competitive in the market. Uh, I can appreciate that, that what Dr. Pody had just said, but this is a brand new position and it's system wide. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I defer to the administration on this one. I'll tell you why, because there is a lot of thought that goes into a salary scale. When you put it together, you have to compare this to other uh, salaries. And the superintendent can come back to us if uh, she goes to, when she goes to the market and gets applicants. And if she can't get someone at this salary range, she can come back to us and say, I have to change the range. So I, I personally, if I'm hearing from the school administration that done an analysis and this would impact other, or impact the salary scale for other like positions, I, I, I can't support the amendment. But if the superintendent said we could go to 120 based on her analysis, then I would be comfortable with that. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, if I may ask uh, the proposer, uh, the proponent of the amendment on what basis does he state that the 125 is required to be competitive with other districts? Uh, 
town of Burlington and a, and a couple of other districts that have already uh, hired people for this position, they, they're starting at 120 that I've seen my research. What I heard from the superintendent is a concern about how other members of the, the staff and related. Um, uh, I understand that, but at the same time, I, I've said what I had to say. Uh, Ms. Exton. So I, I agree with Mr. Hainer that from a, the perspective of other towns that the numbers are low. Um, the, the average that I found um, from the, the town manager 12 that have this position or are hiring for it right now um, is 120. But I also appreciate the context within within the district. Um, and I'm, I was, I was looking, I don't have that um, information in front of me of, of the salaries within, um, within Arlington. So um, I'm inclined to support the motion um, based on what is, what other towns are doing to hire for this position right now. And I know that it's a highly sought after position um, and a lot of a lot of districts are looking for people to fill this position. And so I think we should com be competitive for that reason. Mr. Hainer. The, the, the rationale that Dr. Bodhi gave is not something we have considered the CFO spot, the assistant superintendent spot uh, for, um, and these, these and uh, the special education uh, director. These are all comparable uh, positions. This, this position is going to be uh, responsible directly to the superintendent. Um, and the, the positions I just mentioned are, uh, their salaries are in excess of $125,000. I'm not suggesting that we, but that's where the comparison should be made within the district. All right, further discussion on this. Um, all right, so we have a, um, do we want to vote separately on the amendment by Mr. Hainer and then take up the job description? So um, that's usually how it's done. Thanks. Uh, so the amendment by Mr. Hainer seconded by Mr. Schlickman, is there any more discussion on uh, so, Mr. Hainer, your amendment is to is to provide in the job description a salary range between 105 and 125 thousand per year. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. All right. Uh, any more discussion on that, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin. No. Uh, Mr. Thielman. No. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Um, and I am also yes. So let's vote. Uh, so next would be a motion on the uh, job description as amended. Uh, any more discussion? Is there a motion for that? So move. Second. Uh, discussion. All right, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the monthly financial report. Mr. Mason, we've punted you for weeks at a time. Are we on to the next report at this point? Or yes. right, okay, we just we yeah, perfect. That's that's the way to do it. Outstanding. All right, Mr. Mason, <laughs> tell us what you got. Um. So I, I, I just want to basically um, we, we have the monthly reports that's not the month ending of January, which was missed. It was for the month ending of February uh, 28th. Um, this includes the, the three normal reports that you would normally see, which is the general fund um, or town appropriation grants and special revenue and revolving accounts. Um, on the general fund, the town appropriation, currently we're projecting um, $672,000 um, balance. And uh, you know we're getting closer to the end of the year where we'll get a better understanding of where our balance will be, but there's still some spending. And, and you know as of that particular date that's occurred in March, 
and that will possibly occur in April that will um, lead to either for the reopening of schools and you know our normal spending routine is that departmental spending is stopped at some point or slowed down at some point in April. Um, most of that, uh, once again, that balance is driven by the out of district tuition, which is what we did reduce in the FY22 proposed budget. And um, you just be mindful that we did, a, did prepay the $1.3 million in FY20 uh, for FY21 special education out of district tuition. Um, we also did receive additional funds this year from to cover like the federal funds from the CVRF and ESSER. Um, so that is also, but if you think about that, that means that we really did spend um, more than what we normally have allocated at this point or what we're projecting to do, uh, to do so. Um, so I, I hope that the next report will be give us a little bit more accurate picture of where we're gonna end off in our, and uh, we're going to have to definitely look at, as Dr. McNeil spoke about earlier, about some of the, the different licenses that we might have to look at where some of those licenses will end and whether we have to do any additional procurements at the end of this year uh, to continue to support those, the, the technology um, and software that uh, we need to provide for students throughout the summer. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, there's probably not much difference in the report than previous reports, besides that the projection is showing that it's going, showing a lower balance. And I will open up for questions if anyone has any. Great questions for Mr. Mason on his monthly report. Mr. Cardin, you're doing great with the hand now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff, when you were drinking, you were drinking from an invisible cup before. It was very, uh, very cool. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I worked that into my, my, my routine. Yeah, a routine. Yeah. New magic act, I got. Uh, okay, so Mr. Mason, you mentioned the, um, the CBRF funding. Um, uh, so that funding has been spent on things that are not included in this report. Is that correct? Correct. correct. All right. So at some at some point, we should get a list of what that was spent on. You may have given it to us before, but um, uh, I don't know if you've shifted things around or what. But um, uh, yes, the additional. Yes, so I, I would like a report on that at some point, thanks. Sure, we will do. Anybody else for Mr. Mason, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, you're saying that we'll get a better picture of this in about a month. Uh, uh, can you just give us a sense on a scale of surplus happiness to deficit nightmare? How are you sleeping at night? I'm sleeping fine, so I, I I'm sure that we'll we'll be in a good spot. I think there's some further conversations that the budget subcommittee needs to have in in regards to figuring out how we want to end the year and um, in working with what we can actually turn back to the town. Mm -hmm. um, I I think that that's where I was referring to a, a better picture. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's important that since we did carry over some funds um, and prepaid that them for special education out of district mm -hmm. tuition, that we do consider um, any possible turn back this year. And so I do think that we'll be fine, but I, I'm, I'll have to wait and see until that March, April timeline where I'll get to see this final surge of spending come through in my office. Uh, I, able to. I, I, I get a sense of where you're sitting right now. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. All right. Any more questions for Mr. Mason? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I'm glad we uh, glad we got you on our agenda finally. Um, good to hear from you as always. Um, okay. Superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. And hear you. Sorry, um, I have three things. One of which is um, the webinar and actually the public forum we had this last week with Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. And I'm going to actually ask Dr. McNeil if he'd be willing to talk about that. And then just a quick update on the high school and athletics. Yes, Dr. so McNeil? yes, thank you, Dr. Bodie. Hopefully uh, many of our school committee members were able to 
attend on Sunday. I know it was a beautiful day outside, um, but I want to first start off by saying that I would like to acknowledge Andrea Nicolay, director of our libraries, Anna Litton, assistant director of the Robbins Library, Julie Dunn, director of communications, grant and title one, and Jillian Harvey, director of diversity, equity and inclusion for the town for their support and uh, planning and their collaborative efforts to plan uh, this event. It was so exciting. It was definitely a highlight of my career to have a conversation with one of the most premier experts on racial equity and racial identity. Um, Dr. Tatum's answers were clear. Um, she gave a lot of uh, concrete steps that I feel that people who are listening could take back and incorporate in their conversations with their children uh, from the community and educators uh, could take the things that she um, shared back to their classrooms immediately. I also want to acknowledge the Arlington Education Foundation for their support as always. And um, it was just a, a great event. And I've heard nothing but positive feedback um, from the community. And then we were also able to have her back on Monday, the 21st, uh, for our Arlington staff. And um, Ms. Harvey uh, moderated that conversation. And so uh, again, that was from the support from the, the libraries and our Arlington Education Foundation. And so we had about, on Sunday, we had about 289 uh, people attend. And then on Monday, it was about 200, uh, 206. So we had quite a few people attend. And, you know, just some of the highlights of the things that she talked about uh, provided us with an overview of how we can support our students of color and really understand um, how students and people develop you know, their racial identity and what kind of things uh, add to that or take away from that if we are not uh, very vigilant about making sure that there's representations of all cultures in our curriculum and in our public school environment and in the, in the overall environment within the community of Arlington. Uh, one of the things she talked about were the ABCs where you know, we have to provide affirmation for everyone um, and we have to take efforts to build community, which includes all of our um, students of color and people of color within our Arlington community and cultivating leadership. Um, so those are some things. She also talked about the importance of affinity groups. Um, and she talked about, again, a curriculum and making sure we have representations of all people and their cultures. And so I, I feel like she gave us a, a blueprint for how to move forward. And we're also going to extend these conversations. Um, I'm in talks with Dr. Liza Toulousen, who has come in and held parent forums within the community in the past. And we're gonna identify dates where we can have, um, we have some tentative dates planned right now, but because of our bringing all the kids back K through five and at the middle school, um, we're gonna push those dates out so we can have more uh, participation. So we're gonna continue these conversations, continue to have uh, utilize the book, Dr. Tatum's book as a foundation for those conversations. And I look forward to the learning that we'll have and the discussions that we'll have as well. So any questions or comments? Um, and again, I wanna extend the offer to any school committee member who doesn't have the book. Uh, we have purchased, it, purchased the book for all Arlington staff members and I have extra copies in my office. So if you would like a book, uh, please reach out to me and I can make one available. We'll have it delivered. <laughs> right, we'll have it delivered. Have it delivered. Absolutely. Um, I would just add to your comments. First of all, uh, thank, thank you, Dr. McNeil, because you offered a lot of leadership in, in this. Um, I thought that she was quite personal, she was very personal and also at the same time quite profound in terms of her observations and um, ideas for us that we can learn from and move forward with. So we are also taking the audit study that uh, was offered, uh, we have a report on, and that's going to be some foundation for all the curriculum work that will go on this summer. So it was um, an amazing 
time to meet with her. I wish, um, so I think everyone who attended really was impressed and learned a lot from her. So thank you for, thank you for all you've done to make it possible. Sure, Dr. Bodhi, I just also want to add that uh, the conversation, uh, both conversations were recorded and the conversation, Sunday's conversation is available on the ACMI uh, website. Great. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. I saw that Ms. Exton wanted to make a comment or had a question. So Ms. Exton. Thank you. No, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. McNeil for, he essentially facilitated the conversation with um, Dr. Tatum on Sunday um, that I had the opportunity to attend. And uh, I thought you did a really nice job. Um, it was exciting to listen to both of you sort of engage in that dialogue um, about real things that are happening here in Arlington. Uh, you know, she, she helped the community to dive into things that we're thinking about here. And I, I appreciated the role that you took in that as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Great, Dr. Bodhi, back to you. All right, back to me. Um, I want, at the high school, we always do a little bit of an update. Um, things are moving quite well. Um, I wish you could be in the school committee room because you have a bird's eye view of all the progress that's going on. Um, so that is, it, that's, that's happening. We're now starting to begin some of the work of um, the interior committee. And that in fact, first of those many meetings are going is starting tomorrow. So that's moving forward. And the next um, building committee meeting is Tuesday, April 6th. One thing I would encourage people, well, anybody who's still listening here, um, to like look at the AHS building website because you know, there's a wealth of information, but I think what is very um, interesting is to look at the videos that are there. So um, that's where we are with the high school, unless you have any questions. Um, and then the other is athletics. One thing I, because of the time last, last meeting, I, I omitted mentioning the ski team this year. They did. They had a great season. It was the first season they represented Arlington High School, and um, that they they just had a, a, a great season for the first one. And look forward to many more seasons uh, having a ski team. Um, we currently we are in what the it's called the fall two. So this year we're having four seasons for athletics. And right now we have 250 students enrolled in fall two, which includes um, some of the sports that were you know, outside looking at the football field. But the fact that we have 250 students, that is terrific. It's a way for them to relate and be together. And um, I, I do appreciate that. We are limiting spectators to two per athlete, but uh, many of these are um, live being live streamed as well. We will be moving into uh, the last season of the year on April 26th. And um, I'm expecting there'll probably even be more students going out for the, the spring season. The one thing I will point out is we had a very interesting um, uh, event. I think that one of the first of the kind though, gymnastics and some of this as well, this, this um, in the winter is a virtual track meet. And our first one was, I think it was with Reading. And we had 110 students, you know, doing the various races. And each, each uh, community or each uh, team would put their uh, scores into a third party. And that's how you, you learn whether you, you won that particular race or not. You know, it uh, was very, very interesting. And who knows, maybe that'll be something that will continue, it's hard to say, uh, in the future. But at any rate, um, the, the kids are doing well and um, I commend them all for all the effort they put into uh, the practices, which I can see myself as I leave the building. Um, last, uh, I guess that's it. That's the last thing I wanted to mention. We talked about enrollment already. So um, that's my report for tonight. Great, thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? 
All right, seeing none, um, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant dated 316-2021, warrant number 21203, total warrant amount 768404.22, minutes for approval, school committee regular meeting, March 11th, 2021. So move. Second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Exon? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Uh, the next item on the agenda is policy BEDB, agenda format prep and dissemination and JKAA physical restraint of students. And this is a first read on both policies. Is that correct, Mr. Schlickman? That is correct. BEDB was brought forth at the uh, policies meeting yesterday by Mr. Hainer, who will become our chair, uh, assuming we follow through and elect him next month. Uh, at his request to extend the deadline for getting things into Novus for the committee for workdays preceding the school committee meeting, uh, which would normally be the Friday before the school committee meeting, uh, is a necessary provision to allow us to look over materials and understand them before the meeting. He hopes that will shorten the meeting. Uh, the other policy before us for first read is uh, is JKAA physical restraint of students. This is a technical correction to bring the policy in line with uh, current state regulations. Uh, both are before us for first read and for consideration at our next meeting. Mr. Heiner. I'd just like to add on the agenda format, uh, I also requested that the, as not only the materials be presented to the school committee, but summaries of any written reports and our media be provided to the members as well. All right, any other discussion on this? Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I think my comments on uh, the BEDB, the agenda format prep, um, I mean, I will tell you that over the last nine months that I have been chair, uh, we have not had an agenda that has been fully ready on Friday, uh, let alone all of the materials. Um, but I, you know, I, I wish, <laughs> I, I, you know, it, maybe in times when things are a little bit more, uh, stable and less unpredictable, then maybe that will be possible. Um, but it's, I, I've definitely found it hard in, in COVID times, but, uh, you know, certainly I, I appreciate the intent of it. So, um, I think, you know, we just, we just see where it goes. Uh, I know that both Mr. Hainer and Mr. Schlickman have been, uh, have had a lot of feedback for me on the length of our meetings, which I have been grateful to receive over the last 10 months and I am grateful we'll be ending in two weeks time and I will no longer receive such feedback. Um, but I am glad uh, that uh, I'm, you know, I think that this is, I can certainly support this policy if it's what, um, you know, if, if it's what people want to want to do. So we can figure that out uh, in two weeks time on our uh, second read. So uh, other comments, I see Mr. Hainer and Mr. Thielman. I mean, we'll I'll defer to Jeff. Okay, sorry, thanks, Bill. I mean, we're, we'll talk about this next week, but um, I certainly love the idea of trying to get information beforehand. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear from this, the, the administration. The, the, people are very busy within the administration. I think uh, if we enforce the two day work, the, two, the 48 hour rule, that would be a good thing um, and help people with that. But I don't know, we can talk more next week. And I'd, I, I guess my, my request is I'd love to see what the superintendent and her staff say to the suggestion. I'd like to hear their uh, thoughts on how practical it is. Uh, Mr. Hainer and then Mr. Schlickman. I just wanna add that if something is an, an emergency that can be brought before the board up five minutes before the meeting. That I, I wanna make that clear. Um, and, and I'm not gonna, Dr. Bordian, uh, Dr. McNeil uh, talked to the meeting, but I'll let them 
give their opinion right now, if they wish. I, I can certainly wait till the next meeting, but I will say that people have been working very hard to um, get documents to people on time, but it has been a challenging year to do that. And certainly um, Ms. Morgan and I have worked not for lack of work on this and discussions to get the agendas done. I, I the, the, as read in the policy, if you don't have the documents on Friday, then that takes that agenda item and moves it to the following school committee. So one of the things I think that the committee will have to be also cognizant with this policy is that if you make a motion at a school committee meeting to have a particular report at the next school committee meeting, in effect, you're, you're really only giving uh, administration one week. And so that needs to be carefully considered in terms of the scope of what you're asking people to do and abide by this. Mr. Schickman and then Mr. Hainer. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're looking to do is set the table moving forward uh, for the new administration in July. Uh, that said, uh, as a central office employee for 19 years working in law, which was very strict with the Friday 4 p.m. rule, um, it can be done. Uh, and if the deadline is Wednesday or Tuesday or Friday, uh, no matter when that deadline is, it seems just from the school department side, from when I worked, that we were always pushing to the last minute on that deadline day. And a lot of the reports we're receiving are routine and things that are scheduled far in advance, mm -hmm. so that it's not unreasonable to have the meeting sketched out. Uh, and, and I think that we have to have a commitment too to be reasonable in terms of the reports we're asking for um, and the agenda items we're asking for. A lot of it's predictable. Um, and we do have provisions for emergencies. For example, when the uh, commissioner goes and lays down a new directive 24 hours before the meeting or 48 hours before the meeting, of course, we have to get it on there and, and, and put items into Novus to uh, inform folks of what's going on. But so much of what we do is routine and predictable. We deserve the opportunity to read and be thoughtful and understand what's happening uh, before the meeting so that uh, the, the presentations and discussions we have are relative to folks being fully informed of the basics on the issues before we start talking, rather than leading us through uh, all the information within the context of the meeting. Uh, it takes away our time to deliberate, and as you're aware, this is the only place where school committee members are allowed to talk to each other. Um, it, I think it's uh, an essential part of doing good business, and it, it will require a little more discipline on the part of the committee, of our chair, and the new administration, but it it's very traditional that other school committees operate in this manner, and uh, and I think that we need to tighten our procedures up. Uh, Mr. Hainer and then Mr. Carter. I just want to add one thing. I, I also need the time to uh, understand the materials going forward and to be supportive of our administration. I don't want to be uh, learning something at the last minute and then reacting to it. I'd rather have a reaction ahead of time, talk to the administrator and make sure I'm clear. More, more than often, a simple little conversation can clarify things. Mr. Cardin? Yes, I'm sorry, I stepped away for a minute. I, I, I didn't hear, was the rationale for this change because we want more time or because we weren't actually getting the documents the two days in advance, which, which, has, some, which has been, was the case when I was chair as well. Uh, so <laughs> was there, one or the other, or, or what? Mr. Hainer? Uh, I think it's both. To be, need the, needing the time to be reflective on uh, the materials being presented and not getting them at the last minute uh, or getting them in a reasonable amount of time so that we're not uh, 
learning about it that night. I don't know. I hope I didn't muddy the water more. No, that's that's fine. I mean, from my perspective, I think the two days is is sufficient. Um, if if we can be certain that the documents are always going to be there, um, it's always a pain to have to keep checking on Wednesday, then on Thursday morning, and then waiting for Karen to send something. So that's that's been part of my challenge as chair. Part of the challenge was, you know, Monday, Wednesday morning, waking up, finding things missing. Do you then cancel that agenda item because of the policy? Um, it was pretty draconian, but 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 obviously we probably should have done more of that because um, now we've we've let let it slip so much that it's not really a rule anymore. So I definitely support enforcing the existing rule, but I'm not sure I need more time. Thanks, Mr. Schlickman. I I think the time is also critical because if we get things uh, at Tuesday at four, uh, if you're busy on Tuesday night and and we're coming up to town meeting season. Uh, be will we'll be out eight to eleven on on the Wednesday. There's not a lot of time to stop and think and read and look over things. The 48 hours isn't enough. And back in the day when we were getting things on Friday, and you had a weekend to go and analyze and read and think about it and go through the budget documents and uh, and, and respond with some email back if to administration to the superintendent if there are questions. Uh, that facilitates a better meeting because we're all on the same page uh, and, and we understand where we're going. Uh, the, the Tuesday turnaround, even if it's being uh, obeyed religiously, is is awfully fast during busy times of the year. All right. Anybody else on either of these policies for first read? All right. Seeing none. Uh, Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Uh, we heard from Mr. Cardin about budget and Dr. Elsinampi isn't here. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, we had the meeting the uh, last Monday to discuss the uh, travel policy. Dr. Bodhi already uh, has shared that with everybody. Um, we also discussed uh, school committee chat. There was a, uh, there was a consensus that uh, it's gone, going well. Um, there was a suggestion for the following year to maybe uh, offer different times or different days as well so we can get a broader audience. Uh, I would like to just uh, share with the community, the community uh, school committee chat will be this Saturday. The focus will be grades six through 12, but uh, all people are invited. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, thank you. Uh, CIA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, so we did meet with the uh, Human Rights Commission representatives. Um, we went over uh, with Sarah Bird and, and Dr. McNeil the um, the cultural uh, the cultural awareness port, the cultural component of the uh, Panorama Survey. That was very helpful for them. Um, we uh, went over the position description, which we approved tonight, um, and. Uh, talked about a couple other things, nothing, nothing important for the full committee. Thank you. Uh, facilities, Mr. Hillman. Report. Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman. We brought forth our two policies. Uh, high School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. Dr. Boda gave the report, we meet on April 6th. Uh, liaison reports. Uh, I, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Cardin. Yeah, no, I'll just add um, that from the AEF that they, they were very excited over the program this weekend as well, and very thankful for Dr. McNeil for, for helping to organize it, put it together, and bring, bring Arlington schools into, into this um, partnership with the library. Thank you. Uh, any other liaison reports? Uh, announcements? And future agenda items? Uh, Mr. Schickman. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you're aware, the election is April 10th, uh, and I anticipate your glowing re-election uh, along with Mr. Thielman. We look forward to that. Uh, the, unfortunately, due to the schedule, the first school committee meeting after the election isn't until April 29th, and that's also after the start of town meeting. So I would like to ask either 
tonight or to put on the agenda for next week to have the organizational meeting on Monday, April 12th at 7 p.m. Great. Just that piece, though, I assume. Yeah, just the organizational meeting. It's a 15 minute meeting. We go through, we elect the officers, we vote the committee. I know, what, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm saying that for the benefit of the rest of the world who's listening to this. It's just a, a, a structural 15 minute meeting. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Do we want to do the norms that night, or do we want to do that the first meeting of the, uh, of the season? Yeah, we do that with the norm, or with the uh, with the uh, organizational meeting. I think that's in the policy. So, sounds good. Seven. It's seven p.m. Right. That's my proposal. If the yeah, I, I, I mean, the, it oh. ends right at seven, so I'll be uh, okay. I'll be there. Mm -hmm. right, we can talk about that next week. I think Mr. Spiegel's talking to somebody else, or no? Oh yeah, no, I, he's talking to us. Okay, sorry. Who else are you talking to at night? No, I was just wondering about will you have are you going to decide that on the, the next school committee meeting is what April eighth? Yep. And then you would have wouldn't you have to post it by seven yeah. PM on April eighth to have it on Monday night? Yeah. So I I can as current chair just say that we're going to have a meeting on April twelfth at 7 p.m. Why don't we just vote it now and- yeah. uh, Oh, sorry, Ms. X, yeah. so Ms. Exton, can, can we make it 7.30? Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I move that we hold our organizational meeting on April 12th at 7.30 p.m. Second. Great, uh, discussion, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Great. Okay. Anything else? So that is no longer a future agenda item. We have dispensed with it tonight, which is great. Um, anything else for the next meeting? The two things that I had, um, and this is for Dr. McNeil, uh, sort of, and Ms. Elmer potentially, was um, the panorama student and staff results. We were looking for that for the full committee. I believe that was something that was coming up. Um, I don't know that it necessarily has to be on April 8th, but it's the, uh, mercifully, it's the last one that uh, I need to do. And if we don't do it then, then we will pass that request on to Mr. Hainer. Is that something you think you could do on April 8th, Dr. McNeil, or would you rather a later in April meeting for that? Uh, so it, what is, what is, I guess what is- Well, we were looking, so I think there was a readout at, um, at CIAA, right? You guys looked at, at the, the um, student and staff, but there was a request from there that it be done for the full committee as well. Yes, so I, I yes, I can I can have it ready for April 8th. Um, so it would be sort of the condensed version, the 15 minute presentation version, and then whatever questions, you know, people had about sure. it. Sure. Okay, sure. so that's, we're good for that for two weeks time? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. And then uh, the other thing that had been requested at one point by Ms. Exton, but I share the request is um, beginning the conversation about what summer school and ESY would look like. We heard a little bit about that from Dr. Bodhi tonight. Obviously there's no expectation that on April 8th, there is any sort of fully flushed out plan, um, but it would be helpful to sort of start um, you know, obviously it's something of, of significant interest, especially this summer. Um, I think that I would add, uh, given Mr. Schlickman's comments, um, I would say summer school, ELL and ESY uh, as, the, as, um, the, as the topic. And again, this would be, you know, sort of a brief, a brief presentation. Let us know where your thinking is right now, what you're looking at. Um, this was something that, um, I believe that that Ms. Elmer did for us. Um, actually, I think she did an ESY retrospective at the end of the summer or middle of the summer last year. At, that was really helpful because she was sort of the first. They were sort of the first ones that um, were, you know, doing 
doing some of this work with students last summer, which was which was really helpful. So is that something, Ms. Elmer, that you think you could do for us in two weeks time, like a very sort of preliminary? Sure. Um, I, I, I thought that it was a CIA agenda item previously, but um, sure, I, I think ESY, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware is distinct from these other programs. Yeah. And it's an ongoing program. We run it every summer. It's only for eligible students. That's determined throughout the school year. So, you know, we don't have cutoff dates. We don't have invitations to join and whatnot. So, um, you know, it, it will be running pretty much as if it has run um, in other summers with the addition of a uh, remote option as well. But sure, we can have a... Well, maybe we should separate it. That would make it easier for the community to understand if we just if we did just ESY and then we had something else for um, sort of generally summer programming for summer programming and ELL. Does that make sense? I'm super flexible because this is it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm I volunteering Dr. McNeil for the other parts of it. Um, as you mentioned, the committee has been meeting um, for the last several weeks to talk about the other summer programming. Um, I've been a part of those meetings simply so we can talk about shared spaces, but um, Dr. McNeil, I'm not sure if your team will be ready for April 8th, but- April 8th, that sure. Might be sure. I mean, it doesn't need to be like, we're not looking for anything. I'm not looking for anything sort of final, just sort of initial five or 10 mm -hmm. minutes. This is what we've, we've, we've met. This is what we're talking about. These are the things we're concerned about. Um, I don't know. Does that seem reasonable? Is the new Friday rule in place? No, nope. I haven't voted Friday? the policy yet. That's, my a, that's a joke. I was trying to let, provide some funny. levity. <laughs> no, uh, I can I, I can definitely have a summary of what we're thinking about for the summer. No. Um, yes. Um, great. Um, Ms. X, can I just... Sorry, just to give some additional context to the ESY um, piece of it, some of the feedback that uh, we got at the school committee chat um, was about families feeling frustrated um, about communication. And so I just, I think if we can have a conversation in April that the planning is happening and these are the steps that have to happen for it to take place. And, you know, there's, there's the hiring and there's transportation. And just so the community knows that, that it's being thought about and it's being planned um, as we move forward. That was the ESY piece um, from my perspective. Great, all right, anything else? Great, uh, I think that's it. Super, motion to adjourn. I was just gonna say, you're getting really good at this. Maybe you should stay for another year. <laughs> Go move. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Great. Have a good night. Be safe. Good night all.